Palmyra, a tropical island in the South Seas. For most of the year, it's uninhabited. But by strange coincidence, in June of 1974, six sailboats all converged on this tiny island. It should have been Shangri-La, but when bad blood developed, piracy took over, and the only law was the law of the jungle. A small, uninhabited island almost a thousand miles from nowhere. It's hard to believe such a paradise really exists. For most sailors on the South Pacific, Palmyra is a stop on the way to somewhere else. But for a few, it's a destination of its own, a place to disappear from the world. That's just what happened to Mac and Muff Graham, although it wasn't their intention. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. Crime on the high seas falls under the jurisdiction of the FBI. The disappearance of the Grahams and their yacht suggested trouble in paradise. The problem was there was not a shred of evidence to prove it. Palmyra Atoll is a series of small islands in the South Pacific, formed by a coral reef which surrounds a lagoon. It is owned by the United States, and during World War II, it housed a U.S. Navy base. The remains of the deserted base are still on the island today. It is located approximately 1,000 miles from Hawaii and is a stopover point for sailors and yachtsmen on their way to Samoa. Oftentimes, large, beautiful sailboats can be seen at the broken down docks in its lagoon. But on June 26, 1974, a small sailboat named the Iola made its way past the docks and into Palmyra's makeshift harbor. She had just completed a difficult 19-day journey from Hawaii, carrying a crew of two. The boat was not suitable for the trip, and now limped into the lagoon, barely seaworthy. The ship's motor had frozen up about halfway to Palmyra. Before leaving Hawaii, the owners had repaired the Iola, which was a wooden boat, by covering it with a coat of fiberglass. The friction created by these two materials caused a crack to form in the hull. On the way to Palmyra, the Iola had begun to take on water. They had little money and very few provisions. Their plan was to live off the fruits of the island until later in the year. They had made a deal with some friends to bring supplies to the island, which they would exchange for a crop of marijuana they intended to grow. When they arrived at Palmyra, they were unhappy to see a handful of visitors at the dock area. They had hoped they would have the island to themselves. When they came ashore, they were greeted by a welcoming committee. It wasn't at all what they had expected. They introduced themselves as Stephanie Stearns and Roy Allen, even though the name Buck was tattooed on his right arm in plain view. Roy, you got a, you got a buck on your uh, the side there. When one of the yachtsmen commented on it, Stephanie claimed that Buck was his nickname. Something about Roy was different from the other yachters. He seemed rougher, perhaps even a little dangerous. Shortly after Roy and Stephanie arrived, another boat appeared in the channel, a beautiful 38-foot catch called the Sea Wind. It wasn't long before the new arrivals made their way over to the dock. Mac Graham was 53 years old. His wife, Eleanor, nicknamed Muff, was a few years younger. 
Like Roy, they were surprised to find so many people on what was supposed to be an uninhabited island where they planned to spend the better part of a year. Hi, Stephanie. I'm Mac. Yeah. Hey, Mac, you got any cigarettes? Uh, sure. When Roy noticed Mac was a smoker, he asked for a cigarette and took most of the pack. This gesture would be considered impolite anywhere, but on an island, it was particularly so as supplies are limited and can't easily be replaced. For Mac and the others, this was their first insight into the kind of person Roy Allen might be. Roy also boasted about his plans to raise marijuana and trade it for supplies. Soon, everyone began settling into their new life in paradise. Mac Graham began to explore the island, the ruins of the Navy base and the sandy shores. CQ, CQ, CQDA. And he also made sure to keep yeah, in touch with the outside world by shortwave radio. Everything's fine out here. At regularly scheduled times, Mac would contact his friend Kurt Shoemaker in Hawaii and tell him about his latest discoveries. Here is KH6IHG, Hawaii Island calling and listening. He was just like, you know, Tom Sawyer out in the, <laughs> on the Mississippi or something. And so um, he would explain what he did each day. You know, he'd go on excursions, just him, with his machete through the jungle and exploring all the, you know, the things down there. For Roy and Stephanie, on the other hand, things weren't going quite as well. Roy found the island was not well suited for growing marijuana. Living aboard the Iola was difficult. The boat was small, damp, cluttered, and cramped. Their supplies were all but gone, and they began to barter their possessions with the owners of the other boats for food and supplies. To the Grahams and the others, Roy and Stephanie were a nuisance. They were not properly supplied to be out on the high seas this far from civilization. The other yachters had enough supplies for themselves with some extra for emergencies, but not enough to supply Roy and Stephanie. The Grahams were known for their hospitality. They had invited the other visitors to Palmyra aboard the sea wing. Others warned them not to allow Roy and Stephanie on their boat. But Mac wanted to make an attempt at being cordial. On July 5th, two weeks after the Grahams arrived, and long after everyone else on the island had already had the tour of the Sea Wind, Roy and Stephanie received an invitation to visit. They eagerly accepted. Oh, the Sea Wind was a real yacht. You know, it was a, had, uh, it was a beautiful looking boat to begin with, and nice lines, and, and uh, Mac had uh, kept it in just perfect shape. It's gorgeous, huh? That's the, uh, the sea wind was everything the Iola was not. It had a fully stocked larder, and it was equipped with every high-tech navigational device on the market. It had plenty of room, and the sea wind had sailed around the world. Stephanie commented on its size and human comforts. She was enchanted by the big bunk in the forward cabin. Roy remained sullen. When Roy began to find the cramped quarters and damp bedding of the Iola too confining, he decided to move into a makeshift tent on the beach. Stephanie would stay aboard the boat. By now, Roy and Stephanie had bartered most of their possessions with the other yachts for food and supplies. Other than trading or flat-out begging, they had little to do with the others. The situation was getting worse by the day. Most of the marijuana seedlings they had counted on for money had been eaten by insects. Although Palmyra has abundant natural resources, including fish, crabs, bird eggs, and coconuts, Roy had little knowledge of how to survive off the land. To catch fish, he would shoot them with his 22 caliber revolver. Like clockwork, Mac continued his weekly radio conversations with Kurt, and he kept him informed about right. Roy and Stephanie. Okay. They had moved way down the end of the lagoon and would have nothing to do with the other group. And uh, bizarre things like they start planting marijuana again to see if they could grow it. 
uh, he, he needed, uh, I think they were running low on food, so he needed coconuts. He took a chainsaw and cut, cut a coconut tree down to get to the coconuts. That's kind of stupid. It also infuriated Mac Gray. Hey. Mac loved the island and had no tolerance for Roy's destructive What's your ways. Problem? You don't have to do that to get one of these. Why don't you just climb up and get it down? One day he confronted Roy about it. I'd ask you Roy quickly became anyway. angry and told Mac to mind his own business. The hostility between them was built. On July 13th, Muff Graham wrote her mother a letter. She hadn't been enthusiastic about living on an island in the first place, and having Roy and Stephanie there only added to her misgivings. Dearest mother, three boats are here now, but one is leaving and will take this letter with them. That leaves us alone with the hippie couple who plan to stay here and live off the land. It's just our luck they decided to roost in Palmyra. Roy and Stephanie have run out of sugar, cigarettes, and I don't know what. They've bartered with other boats. Next, they will ask us. Muff sent the letter back to civilization with Bernard and Evelyn Leonard, who were leaving Palmyra after a brief stay. The Grahams had previously made arrangements to receive letters over the radio from Kurt Schumacher, who read them to Mac during their regular weekly shortwave contacts. During that period of time, I was receiving mail from both of their mothers, his mother and hers. And um, they would, then I would read this to them. Well, as one of the boats down there would leave, they would take the mail with them and eventually mail it when back in Honolulu or wherever. So there was communication going back and forth. And an interesting thing about it is uh, one of the letters I read, uh, the mother, and I think she was in her 80s, she says uh, that she was afraid for them. She says, you should leave that place. Something will happen to you. One day when Mac was talking to Kurt, he told him that Roy had sent a message with one of the yachts back to his friends in Hawaii. They were supposed to bring Roy and Stephanie supplies to Palmyra, and he told his friends to reply through Kurt's shortwave radio. Mac asked him if he had heard any news from them. But Kurt had heard nothing, and when Mac talked to him about Roy and Stephanie, there was something about their description that worried him. And in between these conversations, he had occasionally mentioned the, the other boat. And uh, I told him, I said, you know, that doesn't sound too good to these people. I said, you know, you better be careful. And he said, well, he said, no, I can take care of myself. I'll be all right. And, uh, so I said, well, I don't know. I think you ought to get out of there myself, or one of you ought to leave. I don't want to hear it. No, I don't, I don't care. Roy and Stephanie's tempers were running dump, short. That's why. Look around you. During the first no, weeks no, of August, the sound of angry voices could frequently be heard across the lagoon. No, I don't want to hear the other visitors to the island saw Roy as a violent and quick-tempered man who was dangerous and should be avoided. Then, midway through August, another boat came to Palmyra and spent a few days. Norman Sanders and Thomas Wolfe were on their way to Samoa. The night before they were set to leave, they had cocktails with Mac and Muff. The talk turned to the Iola. Sanders was a sailing expert. He told them he had offered Roy advice about getting the Iola to Samoa. He said he'd suggested Roy and Stephanie should go there, but Roy had just become angry and refused the help. Wolf cautioned the Grahams that it would be easy for an unsuspecting couple to disappear in a place like Palmyra. In response, Mac opened a drawer and pulled out a 357 Magnum. He assured the others that he could take care of himself. I'm tougher than he is, Mac said confidently. Wolf and Sanders left Palmyra the next day. The, um, the group of people that were down there, the various boats, um, one by one, of course, were on their way somewhere, and they, one after another, left. Visitors had come and gone pretty regularly for the last two months. But with the departure of Wolf and Sanders on August 17th, things changed. This was the end of the season when most sailors would be stopping by Palmyra. Mac and Muff Graham were alone on the island with Stephanie and Roy.
On August 27th, Mac talked to Kurt Shoemaker. Roy and Stephanie and the Grahams had been alone on Palmyra for 10 days. The tension between Mac and Muff Graham and Roy and Stephanie had increased. Muff knew Roy had a gun and a chainsaw, and at one point he'd been seen with an acetylene torch. This scared her and she wanted off Palmyra. But Mac stubbornly didn't want to leave. The boats had moved to opposite sides of the lagoon and the couples pretty much ignored each other. But then, something unusual happened. Here is KH6IHG. I was talking to him, and while we're talking, he hears a, a female voice yelling, saying, saying, you know, calling to him. And uh, he says, oh, what's this company? So he says, hang on a minute, I'll go topside and see. And he says, I'll be darned. She's coming over in her dinghy, and she says she has a cake for him. And he says, uh, I guess they're going to declare a truce or something. Huh? That was the, term, the words he used. He says, I better check this out carefully. I said, OK. So same schedule next week, same time. So I said, be careful now. And you. See you later. Thank was it? Thank you. Thank you. One week later, Shoemaker was at his radio for their regularly scheduled conversation. For the first time since Mac and Muff had left Hawaii, there was no response from the sea wind. I was concerned about that, and uh, I tried for quite a while, about 20 minutes, a half an hour, trying to make contact. So the next contact was a couple of days later, and then I tried again, nothing. And then uh, for the next few weeks, I, I tried, you know, in intermittently from time to time. And then it was at that point that I decided something happened. Unable to convince the authorities that something had gone wrong on Palmyra, Shoemaker had a friend fly over the island. The aerial survey seemed to confirm his worst fears. Palmyra was deserted. There were no boats in the harbor, no Iowa, no sea wind, and there was no sign of life. Well, I had a feeling that, uh, all that time that uh, something had happened. The, the boat had been taken over. I, I was very strong feelings about that, simply because of the, all of the incidents that they related to me and he related and I mean it just pointed to that one thing but I couldn't convince anyone that that was a problem. Shoemaker did have one resource available to him, the radio. Having no idea where they had gone, he spread the word to yachtsmen in the Pacific to be on the lookout for the sea wind. But days, weeks, and then months passed with no word about the fate of Mac and Muff Graham or the sea wind. Two months after the last communication with the Grahams, Bernard and Evelyn Leonard, who had been given the last written message from the Grahams, were at the Alawai Yacht Harbor in Hawaii. Bernard noticed a 38-foot catch with very distinctive lines. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It had been repainted, but Bernard was certain it was the sea wind. He also recognized a familiar figure on deck, Roy Allen. Knowing the tensions that had existed between the Grahams and Roy and Stephanie, and also knowing that the Grahams had not been heard from in some time, Leonard immediately called the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard had been aware of the missing sea wind. When Leonard explained that the owners were not on the boat, the Coast Guard officers felt this might lead to something outside of their jurisdiction. They called the FBI. The call was answered by Special Agent Calvin Shishido, who worked out of the FBI's Hawaii field office. My assignment there was uh, just a general mix of general criminal investigations, security investigations, backgrounds. Uh, it was such a small office that we couldn't specialize. We had to handle everything that came at us. Shishido agreed to meet the Coast Guard and the Leonards at the marina, although what he heard was not conclusive enough to warrant FBI involvement. Perhaps the owners were on shore, or perhaps they had sold the boat. Perhaps it wasn't even the sea wind. After arriving moments later, the Leonards showed him the yacht in question. There seemed to be no one aboard. So he pointed out the uh, uh, areas where there was an attempt to disguise the boat, you know, it had been repainted, the gunnels had been repainted, the, uh, uh, the uh, nameplate was taken off, it was removed and painted over. 
um, and other things that he pointed out to show that it was actually the sea wind. He knew it was the sea wind. Although there was still no direct evidence of foul play, Shishida was growing suspicious. There was no visible activity on the boat, so Shishido instructed the Coast Guard officers to post a lookout. The lookout spotted Roy and Stephanie the next morning, rowing from the floating dock towards shore in a little dinghy. He immediately alerted the Coast Guard, who in turn called Special Agent Shishido. But another boat owner hailed Stephanie and Roy and told them that the Coast Guard had been looking around their boat the day before. Roy noticed a Coast Guard patrol boat in the marina that seemed to be moving towards them. Roy quickly changed direction and headed for the nearest dock. After letting Roy off, Stephanie started to row back to the sea wing. plainclothes policemen were approaching Roy when he spotted them. Without hesitating, he turned and dove off the end of the dock and began to swim away. The officers found a wallet on the dock. And in it was the identification of this Roy Allen, and it had a photograph. And uh, I believe Mr. Leonard found, uh, looked at the picture and said, that was Roy Allen. Meanwhile, the Coast Guard boat had spotted Stephanie in the rowboat and began to give chase. She turned and started to row towards Shri, hoping to reach the dock before they caught up with her. When she reached the dock, she jumped out and began to run but there was nowhere for her to go. The patrol boat was right behind, with Bernard Leonard aboard. He and a Coast Guardsman followed him. saw her dart into a hotel stairwell. They found her hiding behind a potted palm. She immediately recognized Leonard from Palmyra. Come with us. As the Coast Guard officer took her into custody, one question was foremost on Leonard's mind. What had happened to the Grahams? Stephanie Stearns was taken to the Coast Guard offices for questioning. On the way there, Bernard, Leonard, and Stephanie found themselves alone in the rowboat. When he asked if Mac and Muff were still alive, she shook her head. Mac and Muff, she told him, had apparently drowned. At least, they never found their bodies. Leonard was incredulous. How could that have happened? Stephanie explained that she and Roy had been invited to the Sea Wind for dinner, but the Grahams never showed up. The next morning, she and Roy found the Grahams' overturned inflatable Zodiac boat washed up on shore in the shark-infested lagoon. After searching fruitlessly for the bodies, they decided to take their own boat back to Hawaii. But it got hung up on the reef, so they went back and took the abandoned sea wind. Leonard listened to Stephanie, but he didn't believe her story. In the Coast Guard offices, she started telling her story again, this time to Special Agent Shishido in the Coast Guard. Okay. This is the way it happened. This is the way I'm, I'm telling it to you. Details then of what happened to them. At one point, I remember speaking to her. She kept going on and on, and I kept reminding her that she had the right to remain silent and that anything she said could be used against her in a court of law. And she would just keep on talking. 
Stephanie told him she had arrived at the Sea Wind with Roy just about in time for dinner. The boat was strangely quiet. They called out, but no one answered. Hello? Hello? They went below and continued their search, but got no reply. I can't find anybody down here. They're not here. Didn't she say they were going to meet us here? Yeah, they, they knew we were coming for dinner. They assumed the Grahams had gone out fishing for dinner and made themselves at home till they returned. There's nobody here. According to Stephanie, the Grahams never showed up, so they both decided to spend the night on the sea wind. They believed the Grahams would show up any time. But the next morning, when the Grahams hadn't returned, she said they became very worried and went out to look for Muff and Mac as soon as it was light. But all they found was the Grahams' overturned Zodiac washed up on shore and a can full of gasoline. They turned the inflated boat over and started the motor. Then she said they spent the next two days searching for the Grahams or any sign of what might have happened to them. But they found nothing. The Grahams had simply vanished. Shishido found her story implausible. Together, and we went over there. When she explained how they had so taken possession the of the sea wind, her story was quite different from the one she had just told Leonard. No one would have believed us. They would have taken this the time. Boat. She said they had left Palmyra aboard the Sea Wind, towing the Iola, which got caught up on a reef and sank. And all we found. Stephanie was, was we tripping were over her first lie. And but I knew there were at least, you know, two conflicting stories as to how they got in possession of the boat. At this point, we became very. Um, uh, worried about the Graham's condition. We didn't know what had happened to them. And we certainly w w you know, was not gonna get any uh, real true information from Stephanie Stern. But the FBI has jurisdiction over crime on the high seas. Shishido determined he had enough evidence to arrest Stephanie Stearns for interstate transportation of stolen property. Then his attention turned to Stephanie's boyfriend, Roy Allen who had evaded the police at the marina and was still at large. Shishido checked and there was no record of a Roy Allen, but he had the wallet with Roy Allen's picture. Bernard Leonard also told Shishido that Roy had taken marijuana plants to Palmyra and had intended to grow them to sell them. Drugs and a photograph of Roy gave him a starting place. But I suspected that people with, you know, traveling on the Iola, which is not really a seaworthy boat, going around and planting marijuana on the islands and so on, must be involved in drug running. Hi, Cal. How are you? Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. What can I do for you today? Uh, Shishido okay. took the photograph to the Drug uh, Enforcement water, Agency you know, and showed it to several of the agents. So we would like to get photo information on here. They were well, surprised we when they looked at the picture. Our, let me get into it. They told around, him that it was Buck Walker and that they had okay. been looking for him. I'll get back to you on that. Have a good day. Same to you. All right. Thank you. And so we got all the background data on Buck Walker, and that's when our search for Buck Walker began. And uh, that now we're looking for Buck Walker instead of Roy Allen. Buck Dwayne Walker was a convicted felon and a fugitive. He'd been awaiting sentencing on a drug conviction when he and Stephanie fled Hawaii on the Iola headed for Palmyra. As the search for Walker began with a new urgency, Shishida was also concerned about the Grahams. He knew Stephanie was lying and changing details about what had happened on Palmyra. He didn't trust her story about the fate of the Grahams. There was always the possibility that the Grahams were alive and stranded on the island. Shishida made arrangements for himself and some other agents to travel to Palmyra to see if they could find them. We decided to go to Palmyra to see if maybe the Grahams were were stranded there, you know, in need of food, and uh, or they could have been tied up for all we know, and you know, immobile, and uh, their lives were in danger. So we decided to go out there to look around, and and we did. On the island, they found the remains of the camp Buck Walker had abandoned. They took photographs and examined the site thoroughly. 
A search of the island produced no sign of the Grahams. However, Shishido did make a couple of curious discoveries. I remember picking up a hatch cover, and of course, later it was identified as a hatch cover coming off of the Iola. The hatch cover was important because no seaman would leave for high waters without his hatch cover. Without it, the boat could take on water, which would cause it to sink. This told Shishido that Roy and Stephanie had intended to scuttle the Iola. Using these clues, Shishido began to develop his theory as to what happened to the Grahams. My thinking was that they had tied the couple up and put them on the Iola and sank the Iola. And that was the only explanation we had because we couldn't find the Iola and there was no way the Iola could be in Hawaii because they certainly wouldn't be uh, sailing the sea wind and the Iola by themselves. Shishido found something at an old Navy warehouse that piqued his interest. I think one of the things, too, that I noticed was that in an old workshop or warehouse, there was an old uh, air rescue boat or sea rescue boat, and it had a uh, place for three containers where they put provisions. And of the three, two uh, receptacle areas were, you know, the cans were missing, and the third was still left there. And of course, now we're looking for two people. In my mind, you know, suspiciously, suspiciously thought that these two cans, because, you know, it was large enough that they could have been, you know, containing the remains of the uh, couple. Meanwhile, the search for Buck Walker continued. On November 8th, 1974, after spending 10 days hiding out on the lava flows on the big island of Hawaii, Buck resurfaced in a tiny hamlet off the beaten track. He rented a room and went to a restaurant for a drink. Gentlemen, here's your check. At the same moment across the street, two uniformed officers were eating lunch. As they paid the bill, they showed their waitress a picture of Buck Walker. She said he'd just been in the restaurant looking for a drink, and she'd sent him to a bar across the street. The officers spotted him and contacted the FBI. Buck was arrested on a fugitive charge. He was read his rights and handcuffed without a struggle. FBI, you're under arrest. Put your under hands questioning, up. Buck revealed nothing that could help the investigation. He answered questions with a frank yes or no, or with stone silence. The investigators couldn't find even the slightest piece of information that could help them find the Grahams. While Stephanie was in prison awaiting trial, Shishido found more proof Stephanie and Buck were lying. While she was at prison, uh, we found out that she had some photographs developed. So when the photographs were developed and brought back to prison, we seized the photographs and examined them. Among the photographs showed that the sea wind, or Stephanie Stearns was on the sea wind taking a photograph of the Iola on the full sail with Buck Walker on board the Iola. So we knew that at one point, Stephanie was on the sea wind and Buck Walker by himself on the Iola. This right, was different go. than the stories both Buck and Stephanie told officials. Shishida was convinced that the Grahams had been murdered. But without any bodies and no hard evidence, the U.S. attorney assigned to prosecute the case did not believe they could make a homicide charge stand up in court. We could, but it's strictly circumstantial, and we might not win the case. And if we lose the case, and later, you know, years later, if the body should pop up and we get some real good evidence as to murder on the part of the, the Buck Walker and Stephanie Stearns, he, he said we couldn't try them again. So I thought, well, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Buck Walker and Stephanie Stearns were charged with interstate transportation of stolen property. It was an open and shut case. Buck and Stephanie had been caught with possession of the sea wind in Hawaii and had made numerous attempts to change its appearance. Buck had registered it under his name as a homemade boat. Buck and Stephanie were both found guilty. Buck Walker received 10 years for his previous drug conviction and five years for theft of the sea wind. 
Stephanie Stearns received two years for her role in the boat theft. But Shishida was still convinced the couple had killed Mac and Muff Graham, and that somewhere on or around Palmyra was the evidence to prove it. He could only hope that someday it might surface, and then he could charge Buck and Stephanie with murder. On January 21st, 1981, a young South African couple, Robert and Sharon Jordan, were visiting Palmyra. Almost seven years had passed since Mac and Muff Graham disappeared. That afternoon, Sharon went for a walk down the beach and made a startling discovery. Washed up on the shore was an aluminum canister, and beside it, she found human bones and a skull. Around one of the bones was a wristwatch. She had heard the story of Mac and Muff Graham and immediately contacted the Coast Guard. Cal Shishido was catching up on paperwork when he overheard part of a phone conversation. First he heard the words human bones, and then Palmyra. Where's Palmyra? The agent was new and had never heard of the case. Shishido was on his feet immediately. Who was on the phone, he asked. The agent told him it was the Coast Guard. Shishido quickly took the phone and told the Coast Guard to ask the couple who had discovered the bones to stay on the island and wait for them. When I first heard that, of course, I was really excited because I thought, whoa, somebody found some bones on Palmyra and it had to be the Grams. And I thought, this is it. Shishido and a team of investigators flew to Palmyra to examine the new findings. If the bones Sharon Jordan found belonged to either one of the Grahams, the FBI might be able to establish the cause of death. Shishido was shown the gruesome discovery. A skull, human bones, a wristwatch, and some wire, all lying next to an open metal box, identical to the kind Shishido noticed in the rescue boats on his previous visit to the island. He speculated that the wire had been wrapped around the case and had somehow come loose. Then when the case came ashore, it had opened and the bones had spilled out. Since a second container had been missing from the Navy rescue boat, Shishido felt the other victim might still be inside. Divers were sent to search the surrounding waters, looking for a container like the one found on the beach. But in the shark-infested waters, the divers found nothing. When Shishido got back to Honolulu, he sent the container, wire, skull and bones to the FBI laboratory in Washington, D.C. for examination. The skull belonged to a Caucasian woman in her late 40s or early 50s. Dental records showed that it was Muff Graham's. The skull also had signs of charring around the left eye socket and a hole in the left temple. The FBI concluded that the contour of the hole was consistent with a gunshot wound, but due to the age of the wound, could not say conclusively that it was caused by a bullet. The aluminum box was examined by the FBI Elemental Analysis Unit. They found evidence of charring on the outside of the box. Next, the FBI needed to determine if the skeleton had been in the box. They cut out a rectangular section and subjected it to a battery of tests. The rectangular piece of metal was found to contain traces of human protein, conclusive proof that the box had once held a body. The FBI did a, did a tremendous job uh, as far as the container was concerned because they came back with a report that indicated that there were human remains in the container, that the remains had been burned, and that while it was in flame, the container was in about two inches of water. And they found uh, traces of human protein, uh, human fabric in the container and everything, uh, to indicate that a human body was disposed of in the container by flame. 
As Shishido had suspected, Muff Graham had not simply drowned. She had been murdered. The FBI now believed it had enough evidence to prosecute Buck and Stephanie for the murder of Muff Graham. Having served her jail term for the theft of the Sea Wind, Stephanie now had a white collar job in California. She was arrested and taken into custody. Buck Walker was still serving time in prison, or so Shishido thought. When I sent uh, our agents in uh, the state of Washington uh, a lead to put a detainer on Buck Walker, I found out that he was an escapee. And so I thought, oh no, not again. You know, are we gonna have to do this search all over for him? We found that there was only one woman that had visited him and that she had visited him the day before his escape. A trace was placed on the woman which led them to her car, parked in a motel in Yuma, Nevada. The FBI was notified and set up a stakeout. When Buck and another man came out of the motel and approached the car, the FBI moved in. He was considered an armed and dangerous fugitive, wanted both for murder and jail. front seat of the car, they found barbiturates and several thousands of dollars in cash. Buck Walker was arrested and charged with the murder of Muff Graham. Stephanie Stearns was also arrested and charged with the same crime, though they would be tried separately. Because of the publicity the story had generated in Hawaii, the trials were moved to San Francisco. Both cases were assigned to federal prosecutor Elliot Inoki. The motive for the crime was never in doubt. The motive was they were um, without a seaworthy vessel. Uh, the only other couple on the island was leaving shortly. They were running out of food, and they didn't know when any other uh, vessel would get there, if at all, because this was be becoming the end of the so-called season when you could expect uh, people to visit the island. So you had people running out of food uh, and provisions with an inability to get anywhere. Enoki knew he could show Buck and Stephanie had opportunity and motive to kill the Grahams. But first he had to prove in court that Muff Graham was murdered. He also needed to completely discredit Buck and Stephanie's story that the Grahams had drowned. As Inoki began constructing his theory of the case, Shishida was busy putting holes in Buck and Stephanie's defense. The FBI had already found evidence of human protein on the sides of the aluminum box, but since the bones were found next to it, Inoki wanted additional proof that the body had actually been in the box therefore ruling out the possibility of Muff drowning as Buck and Stephanie had claimed. He contacted San Francisco's chief medical examiner, Boyd Stevens. Finding the skeleton together is it's supportive that Miss uh, Graham was in that box and therefore held together. It's not possible for me to really say that she couldn't have stayed together if, if she had been out of the box. However, the problems that would re be required is that um, the skeleton has to stay together even after it's disarticulated. And that's an extremely strong argument that that could not have occurred if she had died and just been laying on the lagoon bottom. The second is that the skeleton has to come ashore together, and, and that's just not really possible. Shishido also decided to test Buck and Stephanie's story that the Graham's dinghy the Zodiac had been found overturned. Uh, of course, you know, a later investigation showed that if the boat had capsized the way she, they, they said she, they found it, the, the outboard motor would have been inoperable because of the salt water going into the engine itself. Um, and of course, we made a test to find out whether the Zodiac could actually tip over accidentally, and we tried to force it to turn upside down, banging into things with, you know, with three or four men sitting on one edge of the boat, and it just wouldn't tip over. Inoki also asked medical examiner Boyd Stevens to examine Muff Graham's skull in order to corroborate the FBI's findings that Muff had been murdered. 
Inoki knew that having two highly respected sources would strengthen his case. Stevens found flat abrasions to the skull, consistent with prolonged confinement in a box, such as the aluminum container. The uh, key issues for us was the flattening of the skull, which represents that it had been placed against a hard, flat surface, primarily across the left side of the face. And what I'm pointing to is the nose, the eye sockets, and what would be the cheek and life, and of course the teeth. One of the things that was evident about the skull of Miss Graham is that this whole area about the face had been planed down so that it was a flat surface. And if you can imagine, if I take this skull and put it across a flat surface, and let's just say this table is coated with sandpaper, and I work it back and forth for a period of time, eventually I would shave it down till it was a flat surface. There was a second plane showing that the skull had changed position and again had been exposed to a flat surface with motion for a long period of time. We used that as an argument that the skull had been within the box and, and moving. If the body had been buried in the coral sand, then it would not be a, a change that we would expect to see. And coffin uh, wear is not seen if somebody's buried in dirt or in coral. It's seen if they're in a, a hard surface container. There were minimal animal bite marks and insects on the skull, which were consistent with remains that had only been exposed to the surface life for a short period of time, presumably the time after the box had surfaced and opened. But what about the charring on the skull in the metal box? Did this show an attempt to destroy the body? Uh, one of the questions we had been asked is whether we could prove that the skull had been burned with an acetylene torch. People who were at Palmyra when Buck and Stephanie were there saw Buck with an acetylene torch. The FBI believe this is what caused the burns to the skull. If Inoki could have Stevens corroborate this, he could further implicate Walker. If a person is exposed to a flame, uh, there may be burning of the outer portions of the skin, but until the water is evaporated, the tissue can't burn and it takes a heat period to boil the water off or evaporate it before the tissue can actually burn. Uh, acetylene torches, of course, run fairly hot and they would do that uh, process fairly rapidly. The marks on the skull clearly showed the use of an extreme source of heat. Further evidence that Muff had been murdered. The forensic evidence overwhelmingly proved that Muff Graham had been murdered. A trial date was set. A trial involving people who live on the high seas presents some unique challenges. The FBI had to subpoena about 40 witnesses and then make sure they were in San Francisco at the time of the trial. Special Agent Hal Marshall was assigned to the case. I first became involved uh, when I transferred to Honolulu in 1981 from uh, Los Angeles. Witnesses were flying in from all over the world, literally. Sharon Jordan and her husband and two children came in twice from South Africa. And one of the hard situations was they were, a lot of these people were boating people who did not keep in touch. Uh, last we heard of some of them, they were in a bay in Hawaii in a boat with no fixed address. And so it was a matter of getting them to San Francisco, sometimes having to wait two or three days, sometimes postponing it, uh, weather conditions and things like that that required us to, to be sure they were there when we needed them. And luckily, uh, everybody showed up that, that needed to show up and everything went smooth. There were only two possible suspects, and Buck had an extensive criminal record. But did Buck commit the murder alone, or was Stephanie also involved? She was the last person known to have contact with the Grahams on the day she brought them a cake. Elliot and Oki believed Stephanie had one strong advantage on her side. Well, um, she had one option. She could blame Walker. And uh, although she didn't directly do that, her attorney certainly did in the way the case was argued and presented. Um, so um, uh, that gave her a very big option that Walker simply did not 
have, or if he had, it was a much more difficult sell because of the circumstances and the personalities involved. Um, uh, he's the one with the prior record, uh, much bigger than, than she is. Um, you know, the testimony about him shooting fish with his gun. I mean, it, he had a lot of things on his side of the ledger that were not on her side of the ledger. One of the other substantial differences uh, is that Stephanie testified in the case, uh, Walker did not, and so she directly refuted any claim of knowledge or involvement in, in, in any kind of homicide. Um, but certainly, um, gave, through her testimony, left uh, a large room for her attorney to argue that Mr. Walker had the uh, opportunity and the means to commit a murder. A jury found Buck Walker guilty after only a few hours of deliberations, and he received a sentence of life in prison. Stephanie Stearns was defended by famed attorney Vincent Bugliosi, who was convinced of her innocence. She was acquitted of all charges when he convinced a jury that Buck not only acted alone, but sought to conceal the crime from his girlfriend. We may never know what really happened on Palmyra on that day in late August, so the forensic evidence paints a grisly picture. Well, empirically, I believe that uh, that Miss Graham was killed exactly as the uh, charge was uh, uh, made. That is, that she was shot. That uh, there was an attempt to burn her body. That her extremities were probably fractured to get her into the box, and that she was cast into the ocean and then eventually came adrift. And I think that that probably happened to the husband as well. Matt Graham's body has never been found, although investigators believe there's a very high likelihood that he's in the other box. For 30 years, Vincent Giganti wandered the streets of New York's Greenwich Village, dressed in a tattered bathrobe and babbling endlessly to himself. To the FBI, he was believed to be the boss of New York's most powerful mafia organization, the Genovese crime family. Was Giganti crazy, or was his behavior a shrewd attempt to disguise his position as a ruthless mafia boss? That question would take years to answer. Every family has eccentrics, even crime families. Crime boss Vincent Giganti, head of New York's Genovese family, was undoubtedly eccentric. The question remained, was he truly mad? Justice rested on the answer. Outwardly, he roamed the streets as a doggedly old man, barely in touch with the reality. But in the eyes of the law, he was a cunning conspirator and responsible for murder. I'm Jim Kallstrom former director of the FBI's New York office. Organized crime takes a concerted effort to crack. The FBI is devoted to cracking it. The case against Giganti hinged on his ability to stand trial. Was his strange behavior an act of madness or a stroke of genius? Anyone who witnessed Giganti's ravings would have found it hard to believe that he controlled the largest and most profitable family in the New York Mafia an organization with a long and bloody history. The origins of the Mafia can be traced back to 13th century feudal Sicilian society. Bands of Sicilian families organized themselves to rebel against the oppressive and ruthless French invaders. Mafia, the acronym for the Italian Morta alla Francia Italia Anella, 
which translates to death to the French is Italy's cry, became the name that these organized families used to refer to themselves, its meaning synonymous with men of honor. By the 19th century, the Mafia re-emerged in Sicily as a purely criminal culture, mostly hiring themselves out to wealthy landowners to oppress upstart peasants. More and more, the goal of the Mafia became focused on how to generate illegal profits. The tradition continued as waves of Italians emigrated to New York in the 1920s. Most immigrants lived in cramped and poor conditions. As a result of growing ethnic tensions, Sicilian Americans became the target of growing resentment. They needed mafia protection more and more. Louis Schillero, a third generation Italian American, is head of the FBI's New York field office. A 23 year veteran, he is an expert on the mafia and its intricate structure. When they first became uh, prevalent in New York City, it, it primarily uh, victimized members of the immigrant community. Where in, in, in lower Manhattan, they became the victims of extortions and protection rackets. And, and that's how the, the Cosa Nostra families originally got their start. With prohibition, influence of the crime families grew out from the isolated neighborhoods and began to spread nationwide. A new form of underworld cooperation emerged. Various crime families across America banded together to supply illegal alcohol to a country willing to pay for it. And I think that probably more than anything gave the Italian gangs, the Italian Cosa Nostra families, a foothold in American society, uh, not only from an organizational standpoint, but certainly from a financial base. Uh, since prohibition, uh, certainly they then expanded into other areas. Operating outside the law meant the mafia had to police itself. For an organization animated by self-interest and greed, there would always be conflict and opposition. An elite group of killers were organized to enforce mafia rules, thereby ensuring its survival. This group of mob enforcers came to be known as Murder, Inc. By the early 1940s, Murder, Inc. would be responsible for hundreds of mob-related murders nationwide. The powerful New York bosses during the Mafia's early years, Lucky Luciano and Frank Costello, set up a ruling body for the Mafia, responsible for delegating territories and duties among the various gangs nationwide. Home for America's five largest families, New York remained the center of the Mafia's expanding foothold in America. It remains so to this day. The five New York families consist currently of the Gambino family, the Bonanno, the Lucchese, uh, the Colombo, and the Genovese family. Uh, each of those families uh, are, are also members of the commission and also have their base in New York City. The commission, composed of the bosses of the five New York families, acts as a criminal board of directors, settling disputes between families and making major decisions on mafia business. Each family is governed by its administration, comprised of the boss, the underboss, and the consigliere, or counselor, who are responsible for directing their family's criminal activity. Below the administration in the family hierarchy are the captains. The captains are the leaders of crews of soldiers, the men responsible for carrying out the day-to-day -day criminal activity. To become a soldier, properly known as a wise guy or good fellow, an individual has to first be made or officially inducted into the secret society. He must blindly obey the rules of Cosa Nostra, Italian for this thing of ours. He is sworn to put the family ahead of all else. If he is asked to kill, he must faithfully do so. It was against this backdrop, a bustling immigrant community with an expanding Cosa Nostra influence, that Vincent Giganti grew up. His parents came from Naples and settled in Lower Manhattan. Vincent finished eighth grade and started trade school, but soon dropped out. Less than a decade later, Giganti became a wise guy in the Genovese crime family. Vincent Giganti's crime career spanned a turbulent time in American mafia history. 
The mob had expanded its reach into legitimate businesses, the various families fighting to control them. And in the ensuing turf wars, violence was often the final arbiter. The family that Giganti attached himself to was steeped in Cosa Nostra's American origins. The infamous Charles Lucky Luciano, responsible for organizing and structuring the American Mafia, was the family's first boss until he was imprisoned in 1936. As a result, Luciano's family administration, Frank Costello, nicknamed the Prime Minister of the Underworld, and Vito Genovese, fought for control of the family. Costello won out, but Vito Genovese began plotting his takeover. A young Vincent Giganti first gained notoriety as a mobster in 1957 when he attempted to murder Frank Costello. Within the Mafia, it was widely believed that Vito Genovese had ordered the hit to get rid of his rival. Giganti's bullet only grazed Costello's head, but apparently Costello got the message. Soon after the shooting, he put out word that he was retiring. Vito Genovese was now the boss of the family that would take his name. Giganti was arrested for attempted murder and brought to trial, but the case was dismissed for lack of a witness. The location and angle of Costello's wound indicated he probably saw the would-be assassin, but at the trial, he failed to identify Giganti as the shooter. Even for an ousted boss, the oath of secrecy remained sacred. Giganti continued to make money for the Genovese family through illegal enterprises. Two years after the failed assassination attempt, he was arrested and convicted of narcotics violations. He received a seven-year sentence. Convicted mobsters are expected to do their time and remain silent. If Giganti served his time and kept his mouth shut, he would be rewarded after his release. It was up to Giganti to figure out how to avoid future arrests. He was a model prisoner, neat, polite, and willing to take on any job. Giganti's cooperation was so impressive that some prison officials wrote glowing reports. He was released early from the federal penitentiary in Lewisburg for good behavior when he was 35 years old. Giganti now devised a secret plan that he hoped would prevent his return to prison forever. He didn't want to leave his mafia life or give up his shot at becoming the boss of the family. After his release in 1964, Giganti's public behavior began to grow bizarre. He became a frequent sight on the streets of Greenwich Village. Giganti could be found wandering the neighborhood, appearing disoriented and mentally unstable. Not long after he left prison, Giganti learned of a police investigation over his association with known mobsters. In 1969, he was indicted for attempting to bribe New Jersey police officers. Allegedly, he offered them money in exchange for information about surveillance and ongoing investigations in the Genovese family. Now at almost 40 years old, he returned to his mental disability as a foil and checked himself into a psychiatric hospital for the first time. To support his story, Giganti and his relatives began to revise his medical history. While Giganti was at Lewisburg, his mother had been required to fill out a detailed family history. She said Vincent was a healthy, happy child. She noted only a speech impediment and a slight heart murmur. He had been a boxer, but never had a serious injury. By the time of the 1969 indictment, however, Giganti's lawyers claimed he was not competent to stand trial. His family suddenly remembered a host of mental problems. He had been given to severe temper tantrums. He had a phobia for the dark. He had been truant from school. He was at one time obese and had learning problems. The incompetency argument worked. Giganti never stood trial for the 1969 bribery charges. 
That same year, Giganti's boss, Vito Genovese, died of heart failure while serving a prison sentence for narcotics trafficking. In the decade that followed, the Genovese family was so secretive that for law enforcement, it was difficult to tell exactly who the boss was. Even had the FBI been able to identify the Genovese family leadership, making a case against them was another story. Witnesses were hard to come by. Mobsters who violated the sacred oath faced certain death. The best the FBI could do was to go after individual crimes. There were no laws that focused on bringing down the entire criminal family. As Giganti was moving up in the family, the federal government was about to make the FBI's job a little easier. In 1970, Congress passed the Racketeer Influences and Corrupt Organization Act, better known as the RICO laws. What the racketeering law allowed us to do was to look at the family as a criminal enterprise and to attack the family as a criminal uh, act. Uh, that became much more effective you, if you look back from the mid-70s to the 80s in terms of actually indicting the entire family and the entire hierarchy of that family. The RICO laws require that the government prove that mafia families are essentially criminal enterprises. They must show that the crimes committed by the boss and members of his family are committed to either expand the criminal enterprise or to increase a family member's position within that enterprise. To successfully bring down a family, the government has to prove that any one of several criminal acts, ranging from racketeering and extortion to murder, has been committed. By 1979, now armed with federal legislation aimed directly at organized crime, the FBI had devoted teams to exclusively focus investigations on the five major families. The FBI's Genovese squad finally learned that Vincent Giganti was on a fast track with the family. Special Agent Richard Rudolph had been assigned to investigate the Genovese crime family. Through uh, informants and other law enforcement agencies who were exchanging information, we became aware that uh, Mr. Giganti was a, uh, an individual uh, which, with much respect in the Genovese crime family, and operated out of an area in Lower Manhattan. Um, because he was a, uh, an up-and-coming person uh, with a lot of respect within the family, we began to do some surveillances of Mr. Giganti. With the FBI continuing to build its arsenal against organized crime, Giganti's cat and mouse game intensified. He stepped up his public show of mental disorder. In the late 70s and into the 80s, he was admitted five more times for psychiatric treatment. The FBI continued to keep tabs on Giganti. Agents learned that he frequented the Triangle Social Club, a gathering place for Genovese crime figures. He could be found there almost on a daily basis. He lived in the, in the neighborhood. Um, he was an, an individual that could be found there um, in the uh, late afternoons and into the early hours of the morning. And people would come to see him as opposed to uh, him going to see other people. Though Giganti's association in the Genovese family seemed certain to investigators, Giganti's family and doctors continuously told investigators that he led a very narrow existence. They said his whole world was confined to the block where he lived and the church he attended with his mother. He was barely functional at home and could not care for himself, they said. But with every passing day, the FBI and New York police were seeing a very different Vincent Giganti. In the early 1980s, the mafia in the Northeast went through a particularly tumultuous time with several killings. Internal disputes within the family resulted in a string of assassinations. The FBI suspected Giganti was responsible for these gangland executions, especially those intended as punishment for breaking Cosa Nostra rules. Giganti was known to be a traditionalist. He wanted the rules obeyed, and when they were broken, retribution was sure to follow. It started with the murder of Philadelphia crime boss, Angelo Bruno. 
Although Bruno's family was well outside New York, all families answered to the members of the commission. Giganti was upset because Bruno had been assassinated by his own men in a grab for control of the family. A Cosa Nostra rule had been violated. No one can kill a boss unless the commission sanctions it, and they seldom do. It was rumored that Giganti himself launched an investigation into Bruno's murder. Retribution was swift. Less than a month later, Tony Bananas Caponegro, identified as one of Bruno's assassins, was found dead. He had been shot 15 times and stabbed in the back. His body was stuffed in a trunk, and $20 bills were littered around his body, a clear message that he was killed for his greed. On the same day, another body was discovered. This time it was Fred Salerno, dead of gunshot wounds, dumped in a vacant lot. He too had allegedly participated in Bruno's murder. Phil Testa had taken Angelo Bruno's place as boss. His reign was short. Almost a year after Bruno's execution, Testa was blown up entering his own home. Another boss killed without the blessing of the commission. Another avenging act would follow. Rocco Marinucci was next, found dead with fireworks stuffed in his mouth. A gesture designed to show that he was killed for the way in which he had killed Testa. If the Cosa Nostra was to flourish, all of its members had to comply with its rules. There were no exceptions. Giganti was believed to have ordered the murder of one of his own crime family members. Genovese soldier Jerry Papa had murdered two Colombo family members without permission. As punishment for his unsanctioned act, he was brutally shot and killed by members of his own criminal family. Had Giganti become the enforcer for the Northeast Cosa Nostra? Informers within the mob told federal agents that all of these killings had been ordered by Giganti. But information given by admitted criminals is always a problem for potential juries. Criminals will say anything if their cooperation can be traded for a reduced prison sentence. The FBI needed more than the words of criminals looking for a deal. Giganti knew this, and he protected himself accordingly. It seemed that Giganti was now the boss. The FBI began a more focused surveillance effort on Giganti. They learned that the Genovese family had also infiltrated several of New York's major industries, the garment trade, trucking, garbage collection, airport cargo handling, and the city's seafood industry. Vincent Giganti was known on the streets as the Chin, an abbreviation of Chinzino, Little Vincent. Fearing FBI surveillance and wiretaps, family members were not allowed to speak his name. They were to refer to him with hand signals, touching their chins to communicate his nickname. Bringing down the chin was going to take every bit of know-how that the FBI could muster. They were going to have to create their own luck. As a surveillance team member watched one day, a telling crack in the chin's roost appeared. The seemingly frail man was being helped across a busy street. When oncoming traffic threatened, he became suddenly animated, racing to safety. His helplessness somehow overtook him again on the other side. Clearly, there were two gigantes. The mentally troubled one displayed to the public and the determined boss of the Genovese administration. 
the FBI would soon learn of a third. Giganti's ex-wife and their five children lived in New Jersey while he maintained a relationship with his long-standing companion, Olympia Esposito. He usually called on her late at night, looking quite dapper before he was aware of the surveillance. We learned that uh, he frequently uh, visited a uh, townhouse which was located up on 77th Street and the east side of Manhattan where uh, we later learned that um, a common law, uh, he was living with his common law wife and he had been married previously and this was his second family there at this residence. Soon the FBI knew all of the Chin's hangouts. This gave surveillance teams an opportunity to observe Giganti without his knowledge. A major break came when NYPD Organized Crime Task Force member Detective Tom Bruno was able to snap photos of some of Giganti's activities. In 1984, I was assigned to a joint organized crime task force. That task force consisted of FBI agents and New York City police uh, officers, detectives. And uh, we were uh, assigned to investigate the Genovese crime family. Then the uh, next step was to go to Sullivan Street where Chin Giganti lived. His apartment was above a pet store, alleged pet store. And he also had a social club on the block. And when you'd go by the social club, you'd see numerous people that were in the photos. And you'd see them standing in front of, going inside, and then sometimes crossing the street, going to uh, the pet store, which was where the Chin, we believe, met people. Uh, pet store really never had any kind of uh, business that we could see. It had a little cat box in the window, and basically that was it. More and more, Giganti was seen acting normally when he was unaware he was being watched. I see uh, Chin Giganti and I see Andrew Giganti, which is his son, come out of uh, his residence. And I'm just minding my business, walking up the block. Uh, Andrew leaves to get in his car, and the Chin is standing on the corner. And he wasn't helped out of his building, and he was standing on the corner. Andrew gets in his car, pulls out. As he pulls out, there's a car coming up Sullivan Street. It blows the horn. Uh, Chin Giganti yells, Hey, what are you, in a rush? As he does this, I come into the lighted area. He looks, sees me, and all of a sudden his head goes down, and he plays uh, the sick point. Another break followed Detective Bruno's surveillance successes. The FBI managed to rent an apartment close to the townhouse of Giganti's companion, Ms. Esposito. An agent would exit through a back door in the rented apartment building and position himself about 50 feet from Ms. Esposito's townhouse. From there, Ms. Esposito and Giganti could be seen from time to time. An agent watched the couple for four months between midnight and 2 a.m. Assistant U.S. Attorney Andrew Weissman, who later would have to prove Giganti's competency to stand trial, was delighted with the agent's observations. And lo and behold, when he was inside in a place where he didn't think he was being observed, he did all of the normal things that any of us would do. As a matter of fact, what was unusual about those surveillances was that there was nothing unusual about him. He was normal. He was talking to people. He was counting money. Uh, he never wore a shoddy bathrobe. Indeed, the only time he was seen in a bathrobe was, not surprisingly, when he got out of the shower, he would wear a nice, fluffy, Brooks Brothers type bathrobe, which was not at all like the bathrobe that he would wear when he was on the street. So it became pretty obvious to the people conducting the surveillance that he was um, engaging in a concerted effort to give an appearance to the public that was um, false, that was not the way he behaved in real life. 
Investigators continued to watch Giganti's bizarre public behavior. But photos themselves are only a single link in proving criminal activity. Investigators needed hard evidence to corroborate what the photos were suggesting. The Giganti was, in fact, the boss. One wiretap conversation between Genovese crew members gave investigators more proof of Giganti's position in the family. On the tapes, known Genovese members were complaining about the chin. Assistant U.S. Attorney George Stambulidis reviewed these tapes to help prepare a case against Giganti. He's constantly nitpicking his men, trying to always, with a million questions, drilling them and questioning them on what they're involved in. He's always looking to get money from them or, or money from some of the schemes and how he earned um, and how much money he would make from the gambling operations at the Triangle Social Club and things like that. While Giganti micromanaged the internal affairs of his family, the tabloids began calling him the odd father. He uh, would check himself in to a hospital once a year for what his colleagues in the Mafia sarcastically referred to as tune-ups, so that he would have a paper trail showing that he had some, or, or giving the impression that he had some mental condition. And with the assistance of uh, people around him and people in his family, he was able to cultivate this paper trail, giving the impression to anyone who looked at the cold medical records that here's someone who year in, year out, was being treated for some form of mental illness. Giganti knew how to protect himself, both publicly and privately. Mr. Giganti was uh, very clever in uh, how he conducted business, and um, he limited his contacts with, uh, with members of the family. Uh, if there were messages or uh, or items to be discussed regarding illegal activities conducted by the Genovese family, there would be messages passed on to people immediately surrounding him. Access to him was very limited. If uh, the other family wanted to meet with him, uh, more than likely they would have to send a message. Giganti avoided the normal sit-downs or more formal meetings held regularly by other family bosses. He would take meetings when businesses demanded his attention. He and his visitors would stroll the sidewalks through the neighborhood, ensuring that surveillance wiretaps would not pick up any incriminating conversations. The always careful Giganti also suspected Ms. Esposito's phone was tapped, and it was. He never talked business on the phone. He would simply use a payphone or make arrangements to talk elsewhere. The FBI would not be able to use the Chin's own words to make a case against him. Other mobsters were not as smart. Sophisticated bugging operations were allowing the FBI to capture a multitude of other mob business on tape. In early 1985, the Justice Department was bearing down hard on a number of high-level organized crime figures. Most were being charged under the RICO Act. Though RICO had been around since the early 70s, it was only now receiving its first real test. Two of Giganti's men had gotten wind that the bosses of the Gambino and Lucchese families would soon be arrested. They wondered if the chin was vulnerable. One commented that if he gets pinched, all those years in the asylum would be for nothing. On February 19th, the arrests of several crime family bosses were made. The next day, Vincent Giganti checked himself into the hospital and stayed a week. He had successfully avoided the indictment against the New York bosses. Among those arrested was Paul Castellano, head of the Gambino crime family. Prosecutors never brought him to trial. He was killed before they had the chance. By Cosa Nostra standards, the unsanctioned murders of Gambino boss Paul Castellano and his underboss Tommy Bellotti were unpardonable. 
Although John Gotti, a captain in the Gambino family, acted shocked at Castellano's death, it was widely believed that he was responsible. Within two weeks of the murders, Gotti had publicly taken over as boss. Vincent Giganti issued a subtle warning to Gotti. Without mentioning names, he told Gotti that the murderer would have to pay. It took two years, but in 1987, Giganti acted to avenge the murder of his friend and partner in mob business. Through his counselor, Bobby Manna, and some Lucchese family members, Giganti plotted to have Gotti killed. The planning session at a New Jersey restaurant was bugged, and because it was, the FBI saved John Gotti's life. If agents intercept information of a murder plot, they are required by law to try to prevent the killing. So based on the tape, agents warned Gotti. Acting on the FBI warning, John Gotti changed his plans on the day the murder was to take place. Because he was not where he was expected, the murder plot failed. Giganti, however, did not give up. He asked Vicca Musso, acting boss of the Lucchese family, to supervise another hit. It was up to Amuso and his men to work out the details. And that was to have Amuso reach out to Al Diorco, one of his trusted men, just as Mana was one of Giganti's trusted men, and have Diorco use his contacts uh, in other parts of the country to acquire a remote-controlled bomb. But Gotti was arrested and imprisoned before the second plot could be carried out. He died of cancer while serving a life sentence for racketeering involving extortion and murder, including Castellanos. Meanwhile, the FBI had Chin's men on tape conspiring the murder. As the FBI's investigation into Genovese family operations continued, information about a corrupt construction scheme was coming to light. They learned that for years, much of the Genovese family income came from one segment of the construction industry, the window business. The family had managed to keep its hold on window replacement jobs for all of New York City's public housing projects. We learned that um, at that time, there was a, uh, an enormous amount of money being put into uh, refurbishing some of the New York City Housing Authority windows. Uh, there was a, an energy crisis underway. And the timing of this was ideal for the um, organized crime people to become more active in it. What we learned was that uh, the Genovese family, uh, along with uh, two or three other families, were becoming involved in companies that were bidding and installing the windows in some of these housing projects. From the uh, late 1970s up until the late 1980s, uh, there was approximately $190 million worth of contracts given out by the city of New York for the window replacement industry. It was classic mob business and a textbook example of racketeering. The mafia took over an industry to the exclusion of legitimate businesses. Union officials were corrupted. In this case, Iron Workers Local 580. Bids were rigged, and companies or workers trying to play by the rules lost out. For years, the Lucchese and Genovese families operated their construction schemes autonomously. By the early 80s, they realized that a partnership would be much more profitable. By this time, the Lucchese family had a firm hold on Local 580, and the Genovese family had corrupted several contractors. They cooperated because it meant more business. By using the Local 580 as a tool, they were able to exclude several um, contractors from coming in and bidding on some of these projects, and in essence created a uh, somewhat of a monopoly for themselves. On nearly all city housing authority work, and on much of the new construction for the city. The Genovese contractors and installers paid $2 a window. A dollar went to the Lucchese family, 25 cents to the collector, and 75 cents to the boss for the family's role in handling the union. The other dollar went to the crooked union officials who looked the other way as jobs went to non-union workers. 
Refusal to cooperate often carried a penalty of violence. In the late 80s, a Carpenters Union delegate had both of his legs broken by Genovese men for refusing to cooperate, though he maintained that he was unable to get a good look at his attackers. And in 1992, a delegate from Local 580 was shot and killed coming out of his house on Long Island over a disagreement with his Cosa Nostra contracts. The Lucchese and Genovese family arrangement was working very smoothly. That is, until Peter Savino was persuaded to wear a wire. Savino was a Genovese soldier and point man for the window racket. We built a case on him, a murder case on him, and it was sufficiently compelling that he realized, like many of these people, that he didn't want to die in jail. So what did he do? He decided to cooperate. And for an 18-month period, made tape recordings of people in the Genovese family and people in the Lucchese family operating this scheme. Vincent Giganti didn't realize Peter Savino was turning on him. He was happy with Savino's work and satisfied with the window scheme's progression. Savino kept track of the money. He managed the contracts. He supervised the bids. He arranged the payoffs. The boss was happy, but some Genovese family members began to suspect Savino. When bodies were found in the basement of a building he owned, Genovese members were surprised that he was never seriously investigated by law enforcement. As a result of that, people speculated, well, Savino wasn't arrested, yet these bodies were found in a building that's tied to him. Maybe he's cooperating, but nobody was really sure. Savino was a cash cow for Vincent Giganti. He was bringing in hundreds of thousands of dollars for the Genovese family every month. So when Giganti was told of Savino's betrayal, he chose not to believe it and initially refused to order him killed. Savino continued to wear the wire, trying to get other family members to acknowledge Chin and his position as boss of the family. Giganti's troops, however, could never be persuaded to break the boss's rule about not mentioning his name. Remember Eunice Hill? Okay. Vincent had said, when it came time to bid, oh, okay, I'll mention her. Uh, he, he had said to go out and bid the work. It was, don't mention that name. How can you talk like that? That was pretty damning proof. Um, even though it didn't give you a specific crime, it told you that this was a man to be feared. It was hardly somebody who was incompetent. Shortly thereafter, it came to Giganti's attention that Savino was in fact cooperating. Furious at this betrayal, Giganti ordered the murder of Peter Savino. By that time, the FBI had relocated Savino well out of Genovese family reach but not before he supplied agents with thousands of hours of taped conversations. Mr. Savino was also um, in a position to provide us with the historical aspects of how the scheme developed his relationship with uh, the leaders of both the Lucchese and Genovese crime family and what their participation was in this thing. Mr. Savino also was able to uh, tell us how the various members of all of these families interacted with uh, local 580, which was used, again, as the tool to make the scheme work. The FBI was successfully employing the RICO laws to bring down New York's most powerful bosses. As a result, high-ranking family members saw that their only way to avoid long prison terms was to cooperate. Among them were Gambino family underboss Salvador Sammy the Bull Gravano, Giganti was finally arrested and charged under the RICO laws with ordering six people murdered, conspiring to kill three others, and at least 24 counts of racketeering. In short, Giganti was charged with being the boss of the Genovese crime family. But Giganti still had his mental illness history to fall back on. 
Mr. Giganti was indicted in, in May of 1990, and a second indictment was filed against him in June of 1993. Mr. The case against Mr. Giganti was unusual that it spanned uh, several years before it actually went to trial. Uh, he eventually went to trial in June of 1997. During that period of time, the issue was that was before the courts was that uh, whether he was competent to stand trial or not. That issue was finally resolved in, um, in 1996. Seven years after his arrest, a federal district judge declared Vincent Giganti competent to stand trial. Vincent the Chin Giganti was 69 years old when a jury convicted him of conspiring to kill three mafia figures, including Gotti and Savino. He was also found guilty of extortion and union payoff conspiracies in the window replacement scheme. But jurors failed to convict him on charges of directly ordering six murders. Now that Giganti was convicted, his defense lawyers argued that he was not fit to be sentenced. They claimed he was too old, too frail, and too mentally incompetent to understand the punishment. While awaiting sentencing, Giganti was confined to a prison hospital and examined by several doctors. Giganti was given several PET scans, a procedure that uses a radioactive tracer to measure brain chemistry. A 1991 scan, first read as normal, was later found to be too flawed to use in diagnosis. A 1993 scan did show some abnormalities. But at least one expert, Dr. Jonathan Brody, judged these abnormalities as not consistent with dementia. Dr. Brody is an attending psychiatrist at New York's Bellevue Hospital and a professor at New York University's School of Medicine. He also conducts research on schizophrenia. Mr. Giganti, at the time of the scan, was purportedly taking medication that affects the brain. And because it affects the brain, it affects brain chemistry. And brain chemistry is what a PET scan is all about. Giganti was taking an antipsychotic medication and antidepressants, a low potency tranquilizer and sleeping pills. So Dr. Brody was skeptical about the PET scan, but had yet to examine the patient. When the three of us entered the, the observation room, the examining room where he was then uh, brought, I, I was struck at first by his appearance which I said made me think, oh my God, he really is sick. Uh, that that uh, I've missed the boat, he's really very sick. He came in wearing a bathrobe, he was shuffling, he was mumbling, he was uh, making allusions to God. But as the examination progressed, some of Giganti's actions began to raise doubts. But one of the things that really struck me was uh, that I didn't note at the time, but I noted a few seconds later, was when I put out my hand for him to shake it, he didn't shake it. And that's a very automatic behavior. You put your, your hand out, your worst enemy can put his hand out to you, and you tend to take it. How about this, how about this one? When Giganti was asked the names of his children, he didn't know. When he was asked where he lived, he didn't know. And yet, these are things that people tend not to forget. You know, the brain in a dementia tends to work on the process of accounting. The last in, first out. So recent memory tends to be lost, but that's why people who are very demented can often remember very well events from long ago, even if they can't remember recent events. Well, he was not consistent on that. Indeed, he was asked the question about who the President of the United States was, which is a standard question on a psychiatric mental status evaluation. And he scratched his head and he looked perplexed and he said, um, I should know that. I really, I should know that answer. It, it's in there somewhere. Um, and some more questions were asked. He said, I really should know that. And then finally he said, Bush. 
George Bush. And I sat there and thought, oh, he remembered the question. What was striking was not that the answer was incorrect. What was striking was that the question was remembered despite all of the interfering questions. And there were other red flags. He seemed to understand abstract concepts. Dr. Brody asked Giganti if he was proud of his children. Now, pride is really quite an abstract notion. And his response was, yes, they're all working. Legitimate jobs. Legitimacy? Well, that wasn't even a question. Legitimate implies yet something else, that he was able to abstract from the question some intent as to what the question was involved with, and awareness of a distinction between legitimacy and illegitimacy. And here was a man who didn't know what month it was. He didn't know if he was in a hospital. These and other inconsistencies contributed to Dr. Brody's conclusion that Giganti did not suffer from progressive dementia, vascular dementia, or schizophrenia. Guards assigned to watch Giganti during his pre-sentencing hospitalization also found his behavior normal. They testified that he was active around his prison hospital cell and polite to the hospital staff. He did not need help to shout, to groom himself, or to feed himself. The lawyers all put in affidavits that they couldn't communicate with Vincent Giganti at all. Well, when he was in jail, he managed to speak with the prison counselors. When you sort of talk to the sort of low-level people in jail who have to take care of inmates on a day-to-day -day basis, it turns out he knew exactly that what had happened. He knew he had been on trial. He knew that Gravano had testified against him and didn't have very nice things to say about him. He knew that his sentencing was upcoming. He knew what the issue was before Judge Weinstein as to that he had to decide that he was competent to be sentenced. It was completely at odds with what his lawyers were telling Judge Weinstein. Some psychiatrists thought Giganti really was incompetent. Others thought he was faking. Five months and dozens of tests later, the judge ruled. The judge said, in short, the defendant's cognitive and emotional capacity and his communication skills are equivalent to other 69-year-old defendants with limited education. No hallucinations interfere with his abilities to participate in sentencing. He understands the fundamentals of criminal substantive law and procedure. He is deliberately feigning mental illness to avoid punishment, which he fears. Defendant is competent to be sentenced and to serve an appropriate term in prison. Shaliro described efforts of the FBI and prosecutors as historic and courageous. This has been a battle that, that certainly I've been involved with for the last 20 years and, and certainly I think agents that will continue that on over the next five or six years. If the effort could be sustained and the resources maintained, you know, I think we're on the verge of really reducing the effects and the impact of the Cosa Nostra. To be sure, the government's legal victory in the Giganti case was partial. The jury, after all, failed to convict him of the six murder charges. He was originally sentenced to 12 years. In 2003, he pleaded guilty to obstruction of justice and earned three more years, finally admitting in court that he had been faking insanity the entire time. It was Mother's Day, May 13, 1984, a warm spring afternoon near Tampa, Florida. After spending time with their moms, two boys raced off to fly parachutes made from plastic bags. It was the perfect way to spend a Sunday. 
But soon, the wind brought a foul smell. They went off to investigate and found a site they would remember for the rest of their lives. In 1984 in South Florida, a rapist and murderer was on the loose. The killer was a ruthless and terrifying predator, the newest member of an infamous group known as serial killers. He kills just for the sake of it. And though his acts at first seem random, his choice of victims is fiercely selective. A woman's occupation, or even her hairstyle, may be enough to make her a target. It takes time at least two kills before the pattern emerges. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. The serial killer's world is a delicate balance. On one side is the threat of capture. On the other is his overwhelming need to publicize his crime. Our job is to use everything at our disposal to tip the balance in our favor. What the boys found was the body of a nude woman lying in the roadside weeds. The medical examiner determined she'd been there for about three days. Her wrists were bound behind her back, and a rope with a trailing extension was tied around her neck like a leash. Bruises, blisters, and insects covered her body. But it was the position of the corpse that told detectives this was not a typical murder case. Major Gary Terry, then Lieutenant Terry, had just been appointed head of the Hillsborough County Major Crimes Unit when he got the call. But the unique thing about the, the body to me was the fact that her legs were spread about five foot, five foot one inches apart from heel to heel. Uh, a scene that I'll never forget and, and a scene that I've never seen before. The pose was so grotesque, the body seemed to have been positioned that way deliberately. Had the killer meant to shock whoever found it? Crime scene technicians photographed the body and measured its distance from the road. They carefully packaged what little evidence was left, some cloth tied in a knot. Detective Pops Baker of the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Department also found tire tracks. He worked that night to make plaster casts. Tire casts can reveal the make and size of tires to help experts deduce the size and type of car a criminal is driving. They can also link him to a crime scene. Meanwhile, the body was brought to the medical examiner's office with the ligatures in place for him to study and photograph. The medical examiner determined the victim had been raped, then strangled to death. The brutality of the crime brought a sense of urgency to the investigation. Fearing this would not be an isolated case, Lieutenant Terry immediately contacted the FBI's forensics lab in Washington, D.C. Terry had a detective hand carry the evidence to the FBI lab. He had learned during an earlier case that doing so expedited the processing of evidence and brought the FBI in as an immediate active partner. The FBI lab is one of the foremost forensics laboratories in the country. There are experts on every type of evidence, from bullets to fibers to vehicle parts to nuts. 
The FBI's not expert analyzed the ligatures from the tamper victim's wrists and throat. They had been removed intact in hopes they'd tie the killer to his deed. They might also say something about his past. Specialized knots might reveal that he had been a merchant marine or in the military. But the ligatures turned out to be tied in granny knots, simple, functional knots that anyone might have tied. An FBI fiber expert analyzed the fabric found near the body. He brushed particles from the cloth onto a sterile sheet. What traces had the killer left behind? The analyst scanned the particles with a magnifier, but he didn't expect to find much. Such evidence is easily lost through weather or other contamination of the crime scene. In fact, the rule of thumb for fiber evidence is in four hours, 80% is lost. In 48 hours, it's 96%. After three days, the chance of finding anything is almost nil. So he was amazed when he found a small speck of red nylon fiber. It was trilobal, meaning it consisted of three lobes and had a lustrous or shiny coating. From its size, type, and shape, he guessed it was a carpet fiber, maybe from the killer's car. The fact that it was there at all was a minor miracle. The analyst from the FBI lab told the Hillsborough detectives to keep the discovery secret. If this were a serial killer, publicizing fiber evidence would make him change his pattern or his vehicle, so he'd be harder to find. The FBI's tire lab also scored. From the tire casts, they determined the tires were of two different brands. All were well-worn and mounted reversed with the black walls facing out. An irregularity like that could be powerful, incriminating evidence. Back in Tampa, police identified the victim from a fingerprints the day after her body was found. She was Lana Long, a 20-year-old Laotian woman, a popular exotic dancer in Tampa's red light district. Her boyfriend had recognized her from a newspaper photo and had called police. He became the prime suspect. Officers questioned the girls on the strip but received no information implicating the boyfriend or anyone else. They were stopped. Okay, uh, I'll meet you up here at the tape. Then, just two weeks later, the calm of another holiday weekend was broken. On Memorial Day Sunday, Detective Pops Baker and Lieutenant Gary Terry of the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office were called to a second murder scene, again in an isolated rural area off an interstate. Uh, young female, late 18, 19, 20 range. Like Lana Long, this victim was female in her late teens to early 20s and nude. She was also bound at the hands and throat and had a knot at her neck with a leash-like extension. But this knot was different. It was a hangman-style noose. I can remember driving all the way to the crime scene and saying to myself, please don't let this victim be bound. In 1984, we very rarely had homicide victims bound. That's the first thing I asked the officer protecting the crime scene when I drove up. Is she bound? And he said, yes, sir, she is. So we've gone from very rarely having victims bound to two within two weeks. So we knew we had a problem. This woman had not been dead long. She's still warm. Because the crime scene was fresher than the last, more evidence remained. 
Detectives found a man's olive green t-shirt and some strands of hair which they determined were not the victims. Hanging from a bush a few feet away from the woman's head were her white pantyhose and white jumpsuit, both covered with blood. From the brutality of her wounds, detectives knew she had fought for her life and that it had been a savage struggle. She had been raped, strangled, beaten, and her throat had been cut almost from ear to ear. The medical examiner reported three causes of death, asphyxiation, head injuries, and a lacerated throat. As before, Baker found tire tracks. Casks were taken for analysis and comparison to the ones found at the first murder scene. Once again, the crime scene evidence was hand-delivered to the FBI lab in Washington. Analysts found the same red, lusted trilobal carpet fibers as at the first scene. And this time, there were red trilobal delustered fibers too, with the shiny coating absent. It said fiber evidence is the silent witness, but this match seemed to scream that the cases were linked. Lana Long's boyfriend could not be tied to the second murder, and he was cleared as a suspect. The items found at the scene also provided other clues. The green t-shirt was a size large, suggesting a person of medium build and chest size. The head hairs were medium brown, from a male Caucasian. These two pieces of information began a physical evidence profile, which are shared with other law enforcement agencies. FBI tire expert Sandy Wersema analyzed the tire impressions and made another match. The tracks were the same as those from the first murder scene. Now she knew the position of each tire on the car and that they were mounted on a mid-sized vehicle. The advantage of having a cast over the photograph is that I can actually pick the cast up, I can light it from different angles and different directions, and hopefully if there are any cuts or nicks or um, rocks that are caught in the tire, I'll be able to see that in the cast. But perhaps the best clue came from what she didn't know. She knew two of the tires with a common Goodyear Viva brand, but a third wasn't on the FBI's extensive reference list. One of the tire impressions they could not identify from their files. But what they did was gave us the name of a tire expert, a manufacturer out in Akron, Ohio. And we actually flew a detective, Corporal Baker flew out there personally with the tire impressions, met with the old salts out there at the, the tire factory, and they actually were able to identify that tire for us. And that was the Vogue tire. And in 1984, was a handmade tire that comes as standard equipment on Cadillacs. We had never even seen a tire like that before. Police were told that if they found the car with that tire, mounted black walls out, okay. it would be as positive an ID as a fingerprint. Analysis of the victim's knife wound revealed that the killer had a knife with a three-inch blade. Now we've got two victims, both bound and both connected forensically. So we knew we had a serial killer on our hands at that time. It's just a gut feeling that I got. Lieutenant Terry began to track the killer's strikes on a map, hoping they'd reveal a pattern of behavior. He put out the word to patrol officers, look for a white male with brown hair of medium build, driving a mid-sized car with the tires reversed. He may be carrying a knife with a three-inch blade. Following the FBI's recommendation, Terry didn't mention the fiber evidence or the ligatures. From a composite drawing released to the media, the second victim was identified. 22-year-old Michelle Sims had a criminal history of prostitution. She'd been reported missing the day before.
A key member of the Hillsborough County investigative team was Detective Randy Latimer. At this point, though, we realized we're dealing with a serial killer that it looked like he was uh, probably uh, preying on prostitutes. So uh, we went out into to the areas of the known prostitute areas and then started contacting the girls and, and letting them know what was going on, giving them our business cards that if they saw something strange to contact us, let us know. We're looking for information. We were frustrated that we couldn't, we couldn't get any leads. We couldn't get anything to go on. Then on June 24th, another Sunday, Terry, Baker, and Latimer responded to a third murder scene. A worker had found a body in an orange grove. It was another female. But the pattern seemed different. This one was fully clothed and there were no ligatures, so there was no reason to believe it was linked. Well, as you can see. But detectives didn't rule it out. Looks like it's been undisturbed for quite a while. They delivered the victim's clothing to the FBI lab, just in case a connection could be found. This time, the fiber expert they had worked with before was not available, and someone else was assigned. He wasn't asked to compare the new evidence to the old, so he didn't. Nor did he begin the analysis immediately. The body was so badly decomposed, it only weighed 25 pounds, including clothes. It took some time to get an ID. And when it finally came, the victim's lifestyle didn't fit the pattern either. 22-year-old Elizabeth Ludenbach of Tampa was a shy assembly line worker who lived with her family. She had no criminal history and was not a prostitute, although she did frequent bars on Tampa's Strip. A note in Elizabeth's room said to find her boyfriend if anything happened to her. So detectives ordered a polygraph test. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And you just need to answer yes or no to those questions. Do you understand? Yeah. Did you know Elizabeth Luden back? Yes. Did you have a relationship with Elizabeth Ludenbeck? Yes. Did you ever harm Elizabeth Ludenbeck? No. He failed the polygraph test, making him the prime suspect. It wasn't until mid-September three months oh, really? after the discovery of Elizabeth's body in the That's Orange Grove, that the results That's came great. in. Yeah? The FBI had a match. Yeah. They found That's red fantastic. carpet fibers identical to those found in the first two murders. Looks like Ludenbeck is ours. They Good. found red fibers that connected up. Now they had three related killings. Terry entered the new scene Jump on the, the map. Any kind of significant difference? Every detective on the homicide squad was working the case. The nature of the investigation began to change. Instead of focusing on boyfriends and neighbors, detectives pursued an unknown killer terrorizing the women of Tampa. We've taken the entire homicide unit now, are concentrating on these cases. And we're running down leads, we're getting telephone calls about different people, and we're checking those leads out. We're doing a background investigation of, of these particular victims, and we're coming up empty. And all we have to do is Unfortunately, wait, and then there's another victim is discovered. And that is victim number four. After a lull of more than three months, the calm of yet another Sunday was shattered. On October 7th, a worker found a body near the entrance to the K-Bar Ranch in Northern Hillsborough County. This time, Detective Steve Cribb was assigned to help process the scene. 
he, Terry, Baker, and Latimer didn't have to look far for the first grim piece of evidence. The victim's bra hanging from the entrance gate. The nude body of a young black woman was nearby. Her clothing was beside her. Most of the detectives ruled her out as a serial victim. She had been raped, but unlike the others, she had been shot, not strangled, and there were no ligatures. Also, she was African-American, and usually serial killers don't cross racial boundaries. Get her into a controlled environment, we'd be able to really... While the FBI analyzed the evidence, detectives identified the victim from fingerprints. 18-year-old Chanel Devon Williams had just recently been released from jail on a prostitution arrest when she disappeared. She was last seen working the red light district along Nebraska Avenue with a friend, another prostitute, a few days before. She had been dead about six days. The FBI's hair and fiber analysis revealed it was the work of the serial killer. Both types of red fibers were found on Chanel's clothing, along with a brown Caucasian pubic hair. By crossing racial bounds and using a different weapon, the killer had changed his routine. Shifting from a pattern is very rare in serial killers and would make this one more difficult to capture. Chanel was added to the map near the Pasco-Hillsborough County line. With four dead, detectives were desperate to find the killer and obsessed with the case. You don't work these cases. You live and breathe these types of cases. You go home at night, you dream about this case. You eat and sleep it. I would go home at night and just look at the telephone, waiting for it to ring. Every Sunday, for some reason, the first series of bodies were discovered on Sunday. On Sunday, I didn't plan anything. I sat at home. Indeed, the Sunday after Chanel's body turned up, Terry, Baker, Latimer, and Cribb were called to another murder scene. This one was near Lake Thanodasasa, northeast of Tampa. A couple of amateur archaeologists had uncovered a morbid find. At the side of the road was a woman's body, wrapped in a gold-colored bedspread, tied with a blue jogging suit. Thank you. We need that. Inside, her lower legs and ankles were bound with common white string. Her hands were tied in front of her with a red bandana. She had been bound, raped, strangled, hit on the forehead, and dragged through the dirt. It seemed the killer was back to his old pattern. The woman was quickly identified from fingerprints as 28-year-old Karen Din's friend. Raised in an affluent suburban household, she had died a drug-ravaged prostitute. She was last seen alive in the early hours of the day she was killed. As if there weren't enough to link the killer to the crime, investigator Steve Cribb actually saw red trilobal carpet fibers on Karen's body. By now, he developed a sixth sense for them. When you know what you're looking for, they almost look like glow worms on the, on the victims. But for the average person to walk up and find them, even the other investigators who weren't looking for this type, they wouldn't see them but uh, they became such a key point of the investigation that when we went to a crime scene, that's one of the first things we would look for with the carpet fibers. At the FBI lab, the fiber expert compared these fibers to the ones from the other crime scenes. They matched. There were now five cases linked to a single killer, but there was still no name, no face, and no one under arrest. It becomes very frustrating that you know someone else is going to die because you haven't stopped the suspect. Um, you have enough information to know that he's doing it, 
but not enough information to pick him out of the crowd if he were to bump into you walking down the mall. Because you have to remember in this series of cases, our concern is if we don't stop this guy, if we don't find him today, he's going to kill somebody tomorrow or the next day. And when in fact he did. Two weeks later on Halloween, another victim emerged. A contractor digging a ditch found the mummified remains of a woman's body. Terry, Baker, Latimer, and Cribb arrived at the scene. The medical examiner estimated the body had been there for about a month. The body was badly decomposed. An ID would require special measures. The FBI lab needed to soften the skin on the hands in order to get fingerprints. As hard as the victim was to identify, detectives instantly recognized the killer. The body had been completely mummified. The head had been separated by animal activity. Uh, there were no ligatures attached, no clothing. And again, you just look at the body and you realize it's him again. You just have that feeling by now of the crime scenes, of seeing body after body after body, that it should be the same killer. And in fact, it was. Then at 7.30 a.m. on Sunday, November 4th, a call came in to Tampa police that seemed unrelated. A man reported his daughter had been abducted and raped. Seventeen-year-old Lisa McVeigh was leaving work at a Krispy Kreme donut shop on her bicycle. It was around 2.30 a.m. A man snatched her off her bike, threw her into his car, and drove off. He held her at gunpoint, reclined her seat so no one would see her, and told her to remove all of her clothes. He took her to his apartment, bound and gagged. She'd been sexually abused before, and she knew how to read the moods of an abuser. Lisa sensed resistance might send this man into a rage. So she quietly did what he wanted. Lisa memorized all she could about her surroundings. At first, she peeked out from beneath her blindfold. Then when he uncovered her eyes, she saw everything, including his face. She was certain that now he'd never let her leave alive. He took her to his bedroom and repeatedly raped her for 24 hours. Sometimes he slept, but she knew he was armed and that he'd kill her if she tried to leave. After a full day of captivity, the man told Lisa to take a shower. Then he gave her some clothes and made her a sandwich. To her amazement, he said he would take her home. At around 3 a.m., they drove toward her neighborhood. On the way, he stopped at a 24-hour teller machine to withdraw money to get gas. Peeking under her blindfold, Lisa continued to memorize details. The Howard Johnsons, road signs, the word Magnum on the dashboard of his car. He finally released her near her home. After Lisa's adoptive father reported the abduction, she was interviewed by Tampa police officers. 
I want to ask you everything that happened um, the night when you left work, and I'm going to record you. They were amazed by her almost total recall and fierce resolve to catch the rapist. Well, um, I always leave work about 12 o'clock. I got on my bike. Although Lisa had not been killed, there were many similarities to the Hillsborough cases. The abduction, the rape, the man's build and hair color, and even the red interior of his car. Tampa police sent Lisa's sweater to the FBI lab. We were inundating the FBI lab with things to compare for fiber samples, rape cases, assault cases, anything sexually related, any violent crime, we were sent to the FBI lab for a fiber comparison. Meanwhile, just a week after the last body was found, Pasco County detectives were called to another murder scene. On November 6, 1984, a woman's body was found on the same road as the fourth victim, Chanel Williams. Only this time it was to the north, in neighboring Pasco County. Pasco detectives called Hillsboro detectives to a vacant lot near a mobile home park. If you look right here, the body was in a different county, but the ligatures and fibers were all too familiar. Although the body had decomposed to mainly bones, the telltale leash was still attached around the neck. A little bit of shoelace right around there. There was another ligature on an arm bone. Near the body were the woman's tattered blouse and panties and some jewelry. The bones were scattered over almost an acre. When the medical examiner pieced them together, they seemed to belong to a young, white female. She was later identified as 18-year-old Virginia Johnson. Ginny divided her time between Connecticut and Florida, where she worked as a prostitute. She disappeared on her way to buy cigarettes about three weeks earlier. After all that time, it seemed impossible but the FBI lab found a single red, lustrous fiber in Jenny Johnson's hair. Within the week on November 12th, another jurisdiction fell prey to the killer. A body was found on an incline off North Orient Road within Tampa city limits. When Terry and Baker arrived, they found a young white woman, nude but for knee-high stockings. She was face down. When they turned her over, police knew from her bloodied face that she had been savagely beaten and that she had struggled. There were ligature marks on the front of her neck and on both wrists and arms, but no rope was found. Her wadded up blue jeans and flowered top were near her body. Detectives Baker and Cribb immediately saw something stuck to the blue jeans, tiny red fibers. In the pocket of the jeans was the victim's driver's license. Kim Marie Swan was a 21-year-old part-time student who sidelined as an exotic dancer. She was last seen leaving a convenience store near her parents' home the previous afternoon. It seemed the killer had pulled off the road and thrown the body out of his car. There were faint tire impressions in the grass near the roadway. They would match the casts made earlier. The killer was picking up the pace of his killings, and the body count stood at eight. Terry and Baker were desperate. They drove to Atlanta to meet with a detective who helped crack the case of Wayne Williams, a serial killer believed to be responsible for 27 murders. Because something we didn't really want to share publicly in 1984, what do you do when you're 10 bodies, 15, or 20 bodies down, and you don't have the suspect in custody? What do you do? We were sitting down in their office discovering. And during the course of that conversation, the telephone rang. And it, the, the telephone call was from the FBI in Washington. And the FBI lab says, we have just had a match on a piece of fiber evidence submitted from a rape case. And I was blindfolded. That case turned out to be the abduction and rape of Lisa McVeigh only a week earlier. Well, um, well, Tampa police had rushed Lisa's clothing to the FBI lab 
and experts there had found matching red trilobal carpet fibers on her sweater. It was the break they'd been waiting for. I want to play. Terry flew back to Tampa immediately. He formed a task force of officers from the Hillsborough and Pasco County Sheriff's Office, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, and the FBI, along with the Tampa police detectives already working the rape case. Then he divided them into teams, each with a different assignment. They initiated a massive manhunt. Patrol cars fanned out across North Tampa. They were looking for the killer's apartment and his red Dodge Magnum. The information from Lisa McVeigh is their roadmap. The additional personnel and resources brought in by the task force stepped up the search for Lisa McVeigh's abductor. Because the perpetrator used an ATM, one team of investigators subpoenaed the November 4th bank records for all local automatic teller machines. Another team subpoenaed a select list of all the Dodge Magnums in Hillsborough County, almost 500 cars. Then they compared the bank records and the list of Magnum owners looking for a name that matched. And the unique thing when you looked at both lists is that one name jumped out at you is Robert Joe Long. He had a money transaction from the money teller machine, early morning hours. He also was a registered owner of a Dodge Magnum. In addition, earlier that day, a task force team from Tampa spotted a red Dodge Magnum on Nebraska Avenue, the killer's hunting ground. The detectives stopped the car. They told the driver they were looking for a robbery suspect. From his license, they identified him as Robert Joe Long. They photographed him and wrote up a field report. He was cooperative, but wouldn't let them search his car. Uh, of course, they contacted the task force uh, headquarters uh, when they made the stop, and we told them go ahead and stay with it at that particular time, stay with the car once it left, and, and we put a surveillance team together then to stay on him. At that time, a photo pack was assembled, a lineup of photographs, in which he was placed in that photo pack. That photo pack was shown or displayed to Lisa. She looked at it and said, that's the guy that kidnapped me. And she pointed out Bobby Joe Long. Lieutenant Terry had his man, but he couldn't risk making a mistake with a quick arrest. He needed time to obtain warrants and organize his team. To ensure public safety, Terry ordered non-stop surveillance of Long. Units followed Long's every move in unmarked cars. Maybe he sensed they were on his trail because he started cleaning house. Officers cleaned up right behind him. Even when he vacuumed his car, police seized the vacuum. They retrieved everything Long thought he was destroying. After months of tracking a phantom killer, the task force was not about to let him slip away. Less than 24 hours after Lisa McVeigh identified Bobby Joe Long, the arrest plan was firmly in place. The task force moved in. They had followed Long to a movie theater. I'm right over here, Stewie. As he watched the film, undercover detectives watched him. Long seemed unaware he was surrounded. We're sitting at the war room we had constructed down at the operations center. We're heading, and everything is just going 90 miles an hour. We have a surveillance team on the inside of the theater watching it. There's a surveillance team outside watching the car. And that nagging doubt comes to you. Is this really the guy you've been chasing for eight months? Is this really the guy that you has been killing these women? So we tell the surveillance team outside, listen, whatever you do, get up to his car. I don't care if you have to low crawl, whatever you have to do, get to the car and tell us what kind of tires are on the car. And the surveillance team came back and said, hey, there's, there's Goodyear Viva tires on the car, 
They're all black wall. And he said, there's some oddball tire here named Vig Vogue, something like that on the car. As soon as he said that, we knew. When we pulled up and saw the car, saw the tire, the Vogue tire that had been described from one of our uh, tire impressions, when we saw the seat that, were, that revolved, that, that laid back, the red carpet fiber, there wasn't a doubt in our mind that we had the right suspect. Terry gave the order to arrest. Detectives followed long as he left the field. He was never out of their sight. They didn't know if he was armed, so as he approached his car, they jumped him and brought him to the ground. He didn't resist. He was on the ground when I walked up to him and placed my badge next to his face and identified myself as a deputy sheriff, advising him he was under arrest. They took Long's car to the Hillsborough County Sheriff's office garage. Steve Cribb immediately tore out a piece of carpeting and rushed it to an FBI fiber expert flown in from Washington. Statement from you. All right. Meanwhile, Randy Latimer and members Good. of the task force interviewed Bobby Joe yeah. Long, who had declined his right I heard to an when attorney. They you out on the street that you got some uh, cuts and stuff on your hands and arms. Did they take care of all that for you? Oh yeah, that's cuts. Okay. You thirsty? They were well prepared, having consulted the behavioral science unit at the FBI Academy on how to conduct the interview. It's Detective Price. Um, just where you want to start? The game plan was to start by addressing only Lisa McVeigh. Long confessed immediately. Well, I uh, went down there and uh, fucking fired her. After, after he admitted to the rape and abduction of Lisa McVeigh, we talked about uh, why he let her go uh, and, and what went through his mind and what went on. Um, I, I rolled into questioning him about uh, prostitutes. Have you ever picked up any prostitutes? Um, he told me he had in Miami. I asked him about here. Um, and, and he said, well, he might have. Then they began talking to him about the murders. He initially denied it, committing any of the murders. As the interview continued, the FBI fiber expert examined the carpet from Long's car. He compared this sample to the others. It was the moment of truth. As soon as they looked, put them on the comparison microscope, the FBI agent called back and said, bingo, it's a match. The carpet fiber from the car matches the carpet fiber from the different homicide scenes. Um, I'm to me at this point. Excuse me. Terry told Latimer the news. Then Latimer explained it to Long. I mean, we just got information. He told him about the fibers and their significance, and about Long's brown head hair found at the crime scene, and the Vogue tire. Latimer let Long know that by the time they found the second body, they were already on his trail. Uh, what can I say? The evidence was overwhelming. And he looked. He looked down, he had, his, he had his legs kind of, his knees spread apart, and he looked down between his feet, and I said, yeah, I did it. I said, did what? He says, I killed him. I killed who? He says, I killed all those girls. All those girls in the paper, I killed. Um, and, and then we just started going through them one by one after that. But then it just became more and more. You know, Long described each murder in a taped her, so confession. The interview lasted no, five and a half hours. Bobby Long showed no, no emotion, yeah. no remorse, uh, it, it, was, it was just a, an everyday conversation like you and I are having here. Yeah. At the end, uh, I don't remember if it was myself or Bob Price had asked him why he did it. And he said that that was his secret and he was going to take it to the grave with him.
During the interview, Long also confessed to a ninth murder. When detectives found her remains, they also found more of the tiny red carpet fibers. The victim was identified through dental records as 21-year-old Vicki Elliott, a waitress. Long also helped identify his sixth victim, whose body had been found on Halloween. 22-year-old Kimberly Hops was known by the street name of Sugar. She was last seen by her boyfriend getting into a maroon Chrysler Cordoba, probably Long's red Dodge Magnum. The members of the press corps Late that night, today. Lieutenant Terry called a press conference. The multi-agency task force has for months been investigating a probable serial killer. The media thought police would announce yet another body. County, Pasco County. We have they were shocked by the arrest. How long have you had this suspect? Bobby Joe Long, and he's presently been charged with 10 homicides that have occurred over the course of the past six months within Hillsborough County, Pasco County, and the city of Tampa. He was arrested without incident and has subsequently confessed to several of the homicides oh, under investigation. Do you have evidence for all the homicides? Yes, we do. Open five. In the coming days, Hillsborough detectives learned they weren't the only ones tracking law. Task Force member Charles Troy, a Pasco County detective, stumbled upon the truth. He realized that Long fit the description of a man who had raped a Pasco woman months ago. Troy scoured Long's apartment for evidence. He found a photo album filled with photographs of nude women, including the rape victim. In jail, Long confessed and bragged about the crime. Detectives had also found clothing and jewelry from Long's other victims. It's a common quirk of serial killers to keep photos or other trophies of those they kill. Detectives soon realized that Long was the classified ad rapist, named for his M.O. He canvassed the classifieds for women selling beds and other furniture. And when they let him in, he brutally raped them. He had never been apprehended. Long may have raped more than 50 Florida women in the 1970s and 80s, some even during his murder spree. Now with Long finally in jail, detectives reflected on lessons learned. It just shows the importance of physical and trace evidence, shows the importance of the cooperation with the laboratory and what they can do for you, and the effort that you have to put at a crime scene. They're the hours you need to spend there, you, don't, you, you can't rush. You just have to be deliberate, take your time, and be professional in what you're doing. Because oftentimes, the answer is sitting right there in front of you. And the smallest speck, the smallest little piece of information may be the one key that breaks this case. Uh, As detectives got ready for the Thanksgiving weekend, they thought the horrifying eight-month string of killings was finally behind them. They packed up the boxes of evidence and hoped some semblance of normalcy would finally return. But even then, a quiet holiday seemed to evade them. On Thanksgiving Thursday, a couple out walking found a skull, bones, and some clothes as well as three pieces of rope, including a leash-type ligature. But what he really enjoyed was the pain, the torture, and the torment, and the control he exercised over these victims. You can see that in the early crime scenes with, with the leader, the leash-like, attached to their neck, where he choked them out of consciousness. Then the victim wakes up, and he's still there astride her, raping her, torturing her. That's where Mr. Long got his enjoyment, his kicks. Killing, just eliminate a witness. He could do that without any compunction, without any, any trouble at all. When a forensic dentist linked the body to a missing persons report, Long confessed. The victim was Artisan Wick, an 18-year-old bride-to-be who had vanished from a northeast Tampa street corner on March 28th. She had been missing for eight months. Ironically, 
Wick was the first victim taken, though the last one found. She brought the known death toll to 10, but Terry has always believed there were more. I'm confident he's killed other women, other people. Uh, are we gonna find those bodies or discover those other cases? I don't know that we ever will. Bobby Joe Long was never convicted in the classified ad rapes, in part because the statute of limitations had expired by the time he was caught. He did receive six life sentences and 693 years for attacks on women in 1984 and 85. For the Hillsborough murders and the rape of Lisa McVeigh, Long received 33 life sentences. He was sentenced to death for the killings of Virginia Johnson and Michelle Sims. After sentencing, Long left the courthouse whistling a tune. Mr. Long is, is a killing machine. He became very proficient at what he was doing, very skillful at it. And if Mr. Long ever sees the light of day, all you're gonna have to do is follow the trail of his other bodies, of his other victims, because he will kill again. He enjoyed it. Long remains on Florida's death row with no date set for his execution. In 1989, residents of a close-knit apartment community in Virginia gathered for a holiday celebration. For Tammy Brannan and five-year-old daughter Melissa, Christmas was always a special time. Then, without warning, the little girl was gone. Her disappearance ignited an impassioned search. Law enforcement and the local community spared no effort. But would they piece together the evidence and find her before it was too late? In 1989, in front of close to 200 witnesses, a child disappeared. Five-year-old Melissa Brennan vanished from a Christmas party at her mother's apartment complex in Virginia. Children have a way of wandering off, but it soon became clear this was more than a case of a lost child. Someone had taken Melissa. What sorrow compares to a mother's grief? What kind of monster preys on children? I'm Jim Kalstrom, former director of the FBI's New York office. The hunt for Melissa galvanized the community as a nation held its breath and waited for word. All victims deserve justice. All criminals must be punished. But when a crime involves a child, the stakes become so much greater. On December 3rd, 1989, the Woodside apartment complex in Lorton, Virginia, held its Yuletide Christmas party. How's he doing? Okay. <coughs> the Woodside was a large but friendly complex, a community that revolved around family life and children's activities. The kids were always excited about the party, which meant special treats and presents. A single mom, Tammy Brannan, had found in the Woodside Complex a safe community in which to raise her only child, Melissa. As the evening wound down, Tammy stopped to visit with a friend before going home. Can I go get some potato chips? Okay, we'll come right back. Okay. Okay. 
she's so big. So cute. She is. Did you see where she went? She lost sight of her daughter for only a few seconds. But that was long enough for our mother's worst nightmare to begin. disappeared. The Fairfax County, Virginia Police Department was called immediately. I'm going to do everything I can to find your little girl, but you have to tell me everything you can possibly Detective Bill Wilden assured Tammy they would do all they could to find her little girl. The detectives began questioning the people at the party. No one could recall seeing Melissa leave the party or anywhere near the front door. I'm Detective Wilden. This is Rappaport with the Richard Rappaport, the Fairfax Department search commander, joined Detective Wilden to organize the search party. If you come across anything suspicious, an article he would head up the investigation. Does everyone understand? One of the possibilities, of course, there. was that she had just uh, hidden somewhere in the building, was playing with some friends, or had wandered off. So immediately the patrol officers on the scene did a very good job of searching the building and they began a search of the immediate area surrounding the building. The night of December 3rd was a bitterly cold night in the Washington area. Uh, someone outside that was five years old without a lot of protection probably would not have survived uh, through the night. It was that cold. Rappaport coordinated a more specific grid search of the area with patrol officers and dozens of volunteers from the complex. The search effort began. Nearly a hundred neighbors, police, and army personnel from nearby Fort Belvoir combed the woods around the complex. Most were parents themselves, united by a single concern to find Melissa. Like the detectives, they expected to find a shivering and frightened little girl lost in the dark woods and crying for her mother. Officers began to question the 200 people who had attended the party and interview over 400 other Woodside residents. Though the complex was large, many residents knew Melissa and knew her to be very shy. Shocked to hear that she had disappeared, almost all expressed doubt that she would ever have gone off without her mother, and certainly not with a stranger. Detective Wilden went with Tammy to her apartment to interview her. He questioned her extensively about her past, and possible troubles with her neighbors or employer. An accountant, she had never had any problems with anyone. Tammy had lived at Woodside for over three years since her divorce from her husband in Texas. She had experienced the normal readjustments of a newly single mom, but she and her ex-husband were on good terms. When detectives discovered an open window in the furnace room, Nobody Jim Goldman, the crime scene investigator for the Fairfax County Police Department, was asked to examine it. The way the door was set up, everybody had to either go through the crowd to get out the front of the building. Uh, that was the, only, the main door and the only door available to get out, uh, with the exception of the, the hallway down to the bathrooms and the furnace room. They had large, uh, large windows, and in, in the furnace room itself had a, a, a window that was discovered open. And from there, the assumption was made that possibly that's how she uh, was taken from the building. Melissa's disappearance was suddenly far more complicated. The search for a missing child had become a possible abduction case. Did you see her leave the party at any time? The police continued their questioning with even greater urgency and began to hear repeated mention of the strange, even bizarre behavior of the maintenance man for the complex. That was the last what was his name? Several of the women reported how offended they were by extremely vulgar sexual propositions made to them by Caleb Hughes. 
there was a possibility that if she had been abducted for sexual purposes that she might be molested, but we were very, very um, hopeful that we could at least find her alive uh, before her life was in jeopardy. Now that they were dealing with a possible abduction case, detectives returned to Tammy's apartment and collected nightgowns, hairbrushes, and bedclothes, any items bearing traces of Melissa. Can you describe As detectives continued questioning the people at the party, they learned more disturbing details about Hugh's behavior that night. He had spent what seemed to many to be an unusual amount of time playing games with the children. He made the parents uneasy by touching the kids. There was something unsettling, something indecent about him. At the party, he was not dressed uh, uh, as well as the rest of the people. He wore his work clothes. Um, he mingled with some of the people he knew at the party, and he spent some time talking with Melissa's mother, uh, making comments about Melissa, and offered to take Melissa and a couple of the other children to the restroom if they needed to go. He just had some very suspicious behavior from a man of his age around the children. With growing suspicion, the detectives tried repeatedly to reach Hughes by phone and then went to his house, but were told by his wife that she had no idea where he might be. Were you playing with her tonight? He had left the party sometime before our arrival there. He lived only four miles away, but it took us several hours for us to contact him because he had not yet returned home. Finally, two and a half hours after Melissa's disappearance, Caleb Hughes called the police, who then returned to his house. Upon questioning, he claimed he had simply taken the long way home. The officers immediately noticed he was wearing different clothing from that reported by witnesses at the party. I washed clothes tonight when I got home. They're in, they're in the washing machine over there. In the washing machine, they found the clothes Hughes had been wearing, as well as his sneakers and a leather belt with a knife sheath. The knife was missing. You washed your shoes at 2 a.m. in the morning? Yeah. He'd been gone for several hours, and to come home in the middle of the night when your family was asleep, and to feel the immediate need to wash everything you had been wearing, including your shoes, we found that rather suspicious behavior, and that just further added to our our interest in, in his whereabouts. As Hughes appeared reluctant to speak in front of his wife, the officers decided to take him to headquarters for further questioning. Suspecting that Hughes might be covering for time spent with a girlfriend, the officers wanted to allow him the opportunity to tell the real story. Do you know Melissa Brandon? No, I do not. To the detective's surprise, there was no real story. Hughes had no alibi. He claimed he had no idea who Jones. Melissa was, that he had driven the long way home Why were you washing your after shoes? picking up a six-pack, and then had simply washed his clothes. You normally wash your shoes with your clothes? Sometimes, yeah. What were they dirty with? He said as an excuse that, that were, they were his only work clothes and he had to be to work the next day and they were dirty so he needed to clean them for work. Look, am I being charged with anything? Despite hours of intense questioning, Hughes remained no, smug and evasive. I'm free to go. Finally, yeah, Detective to go. Wilden told him he was free to go. But I know you're guilty. He was almost certain Hughes was lying. Well, you're going to have to prove it then, aren't you? As far as the Fairfax County Police Department was concerned, Caleb Hughes was the prime suspect. Believing Caleb Hughes was involved in Melissa's disappearance, Detective Bill Wilden contacted Fairfax County Commonwealth Attorney Robert Horan. It was a suspected homicide, certainly by then. He made some statements that, that were out of character for somebody who really yeah, is a suspect in a uh, crime yeah. of this nature. You would we normally think the, the minute somebody would suggest you or I have a, a abducted a five-year-old child, Look, I mean, you would think we, it would be the most vigorous, vehement outburst. Of course I didn't. Well, they got nothing like that. 
matter of fact, at one point he said to uh, he said to Wilden, "Prove it," which is uh, again a, an unusual reaction for somebody who had nothing to do with it. Gogan had photocopied Melissa's picture and printed hundreds of flyers to help in the search. And as the sun came up, the the search expanded um, into you know, further down south on the highway. Uh, they sent soldiers out to do uh, uh, massive searches through the woods, along the railroad tracks, and, and as possible ideas of, of locations where she might have been were developed, again, um, hundreds of people were were uh, gathered to search and walk those areas. The car Hughes had been driving that night belonged to his wife. She gave investigators permission to impound and search it. Detectives examined it for fingerprints, blood, fibers, hair, any evidence that would document Melissa's presence there. Fingerprint tests revealed that only the Hughes family had left prints on the car. Next, all the hairs and fibers needed to be collected from the interior. This type of trace evidence was usually retrieved with a vacuum cleaner but there was simply too much debris inside. When I first approached the car and looked inside, I, I just kind of went, whoa. Um, they had two large dogs to use. Um, they carried them a lot in that car. They were, it was just cluttered with dirt and debris and, and just, just a mess inside that car. And, and I just kind of shook my head like this was gonna be a, a real challenge. So I decided to, um, to to use the masking tape as an alternative to the vacuum cleaner, just hoping to uh, just get what was on the surface. That was an unusual technique, certainly. Um, in, in my years, that was the first time I ever had run into it uh, in the Fairfax uh, Police Department. And uh, it's, it's a very common technique now. Gogan then placed the tape between layers of clear plastic so that it could be examined intact under a microscope. As the car processing continued, Melissa's disappearance quickly became the lead news story in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Melissa Brannon is three feet tall, 48 pounds with blue eyes and dark blonde, shoulder-length hair. She was last seen wearing a pink ski jacket, red plaid skirt, and black shoes with gold buckles. The night of the party, Melissa had been wearing a navy blue acrylic sweater with a Sesame Street Big Bird picture, red tights, a red cotton plaid skirt, and a pink parka. Uh, when I found the red and blue fibers that were visible on the tape, I, I did kind of get uh, excited about that. But at the time, I was excited but worried because we needed to find her to, to identify uh, the clothes, the possible clothes. Without Melissa, that was going to be real tough. When Gogan conducted luminol testing on the interior of Hughes's car, he found traces of blood on the steering wheel, brake pedal, and floor mat. When a light is shined on the luminol treated area, blood stains will appear fluorescent. While the luminol process is quite accurate as a blood locator, it can also destroy the genetic characteristics of the sample. When I sprayed the steering wheel, I got the reaction on the steering wheel and as well as on the, on the pedals of the vehicle, that's where the, it, it fell to, um, these items were swabbed and, and collected. Hughes's shoes had been washed, but the lab was able to identify possible blood stains on their soles where fresh cuts had been made. It became very suspicious when I received the clothes from the, the officers who searched the house and noticed that he had uh, cut his tennis shoes. Um, kind of kind of putting two and two together that why was he cutting his tennis shoes and why did I get a reaction to blood on the gas bottles? Surely Caleb Hughes had tried to cover his tracks to avoid a link to an unimaginable crime. What is your name? Caleb Hughes. How old are you? With the luminol findings showing blood in his car, the detectives were increasingly confident they could get a confession from Hughes. He was brought in for a polygraph test. He had no explanations for the fresh cuts on his shoes. No. Once again, he gave no explanation for the two-hour, 30-minute delay in getting home. 
But as it yeah. turned out, there never was an explanation. He said, I just took the long way home. It was the best they got. Did you harm Melissa Brannon? No. Did you kill Melissa Brannon? No. These are proven to be deceptive. When Hughes denied outright that he had killed Melissa, polygraph examiner Rick Danielle was sure he was lying. He really denied ever having seen this child, denied knowing who the child was. He was showing pictures of her. Never seen that child before. And of course, the police knew that was not true because he had been at the same table with the child, had talked to the child. You got the wrong guy. I'm asking about what you did. You got the wrong guy. Danielle was absolutely satisfied he was hiding something, that uh, he was lying about something. I'm out of here. He was attempting to deceive him. Of course, none of that under Virginia law, uh, as you may know, no, that's evidence. Uh, you're not allowed to use it at trial. Investigators were convinced Hughes had abducted and harmed the beautiful little girl. But Tammy Brennan tried to keep her hope alive, fighting her worst fears. Melissa's Christmas presents waited under the tree. News 7 has confirmed tonight that the investigation into the disappearance of five-year-old Melissa Brannon appears to be focusing on one primary suspect. Police will continue their search efforts and to pursue leads. There is now a $10,000 reward for any information concerning Melissa's whereabouts. For Tammy Brannon and her parents, the hours passed in an agonizing wait for more information. Melissa's disappearance electrified the tiny rural community of Lorton, a suburb of Washington, D.C. Only five months earlier, 10-year-old Rosie Gordon had been bike riding in her neighborhood when she was abducted, raped, and murdered. Her killer had never been found. Rosie's mother quickly came to Tammy Brennan's support. The yellow ribbons that punctuate trees and balconies at the Woodside apartment complex in Lorton have weathered Once Melissa's disappearance was reported on the news, the community rushed to her support. To the yellow ribbons began appearing on Christmas Brannan. trees throughout the area. Uh, by all indications, Tammy was a wonderful mother, a very loving mother, very, very protective of her child. Melissa was her only child, and I, I just think all those facts together struck a chord that virtually anyone could identify with those circumstances and, and people's hearts went out to the to the Brannon family. Hundreds of people volunteered to post flyers throughout the region and assist the local authorities in their search. A new expert was also brought into the search effort. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children sent John Goad, one of their search and rescue consultants. We are uh, legislated into being as the state clearinghouse for all the information regarding missing persons. And we also assist families and law enforcement, kind of as a liaison between the two, uh, working as many cases as we can. After debriefing, Goad and his partner went directly to the apartment complex clubhouse. Check his stride out here. Outside, they found adult male footprints leading from the furnace room window to a split rail fence whose top rail had recently been broken. We began to find transferences on the other side of the fence into a small parking lot there beside the clubhouse uh, in the parking lot, I think it was an abandoned restaurant or some type of building there. And that's where the track stopped. Straight through here, over this fence. Right from the beginning, we found the adult footprints, but we never found the child's footprints. So we felt comfortable that if that was the abductor we were looking for, and we felt pretty comfortable that it was, that Melissa was probably being carried even from out, outside the window, was being carried by the abductor to the point where she, she and the abductor got in the vehicle. But where would Hughes have taken her? I don't know. Detectives received a lucky break when they interviewed Hughes's wife. She had been somewhat suspicious that he might go somewhere else after work. She didn't want him to go anywhere except to work and directly back home. And so unbeknownst to him, she had made a note of what the mileage was. And the following day told us that she had checked the mileage again and that 12 miles had been put on the car. 
we now had a pe another piece of possible information about the extent to which okay, he could have gone that hours. night. We first marked the location of the crime. This was the apartment complex in southern Fairfax County. We next located Caleb Hughes's residence, which was in northern Prince William County, roughly in this area. We then took a string that was the equivalent of 12 linear miles and tied the two ends of the string together and placed them over the pins. So we simply took a pencil and defined that area so that any point at the end of that string represented the outer limits of the search that was conducted on December the 8th. Within three days of Melissa Brannon's disappearance, investigators had organized a 25 square mile joint search with the Army, Police Department, Civil Air Patrol, and Coast Guard. Over 500 volunteers turned out for the effort. We have a 12 mile radius that we need to cover. We had dozens of search teams that were comprised of trained law enforcement people, civilian volunteers, and military personnel. They were doing step-by-step -step searches of defined areas. Each area had been broken down and was assigned to a team. We're going to be looking for the clothing a lot. That's going to be one of the main things. They had specific instructions on how to search. If they found anything which they thought might be evidence, they were to mark it, uh, not to disturb it. And we had teams of crime scene people who would then respond to that particular location and process the evidence. At this point, we've not found anything today that puts us any closer than we were this morning. The volunteers were frustrated and extremely disappointed. I know there were nights when I would go home and my family would have seen a newscast about another day of searching and my own children would say, Daddy, are you, are you going to find that little girl? When are you going to find that little girl? And, and I think that was a conversation that was occurring in the homes of dozens of investigators and police officers involved in this case. While the search continued, Gogan approached the nearby FBI lab with the evidence he had processed from the car. Because Melissa was still missing, the FBI's state-of-the-art technology would be critical in establishing the connection between the hair, fibers, and bloodstains collected and Hello, Melissa Brennan. Agent Doug Diedrich of the FBI's Trace Evidence Unit would examine the evidence. Perhaps he could find a link to Melissa Brannon. There, you have to go to extraordinary measures to try to recreate, if at all possible, the environment of the victim, the most recent environment, and also the types of hairs that the victim may have, the type of clothing that the victim may had, uh, may have been wearing the night of the disappearance. And that's, that's a difficult part. As long as Melissa was still missing, Filing charges against Caleb Hughes was all but impossible unless compelling evidence could be found. Diedrich and the lab examiners were impressed by the large number of fibers that had transferred onto the passenger seat of Hughes's car. Fairfax County investigators had identified nearly 70 different fibers. That included the, the blue acrylic fibers, the red cotton fibers, the black rabbit hairs, and, and there were, uh, I believe, uh, one or two head hairs in the case. But that's monumental. Sounds like a small number. That's huge. Once the FBI entered the case, its agents conducted their own investigation of Hughes's house. When Caleb Hughes's name was released as the primary and only suspect in the case, a media frenzy followed. Hughes has not been charged in the case, but he is the target of round-the-clock surveillance by the FBI. Federal investigators working with police from Fairfax County last night executed a search warrant on the groundskeeper's rented townhouse. They recovered several items which have been taken to the FBI laboratory to be tested to see if there is any evidence linking this man to Melissa. In the meantime, the FBI's official comment is no comment. 
the FBI brought the power of a federal grand jury to the investigation. The grand jury ordered Hughes to submit to blood and other forensic tests, something the local authorities had not been able to order. Hughes complained bitterly in interviews that his life had been ruined by the invasion. Details of a troubled past emerged. Hughes grew up in an abusive, dysfunctional home. He had a record as a juvenile delinquent, a long history of drug and alcohol abuse, and a disturbing attraction toward children. As an adult, he had been convicted of larceny. He had been convicted of car theft. Um, he had been convicted of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. The evidence indicated that he did spend a, uh, a lot of time with young children, nobody the age of, of Melissa Brannon, but certainly a, a, a lot of children in their early teens. In the lab, FBI examiners had begun analyzing the stains on the soles of Hughes's shoes. Though luminol testing had damaged the samples taken from Hughes's car, they became increasingly convinced that these minute traces contained blood serum proteins that could determine the crucial connection to Melissa. This blood's been... This, yeah. The samples were submitted for DNA and serology tests. Fifteen days after Melissa's abduction, a candlelight vigil for Melissa was held at the apartment complex. The little girl's disappearance had united the Fairfax community in compassion and outrage. And during that whole Christmas season of 1989, that every night on the 6 o'clock news, she saw uh, the video shot that her grandfather had taken of... of Melissa Brannon, and I'm, I'm sure I was like many, many people in the metropolitan area of Washington who felt that they knew her and from seeing this lovely child every night on television. But shortly after New Year's, a judge in the next county received a letter from Hughes's probation officer informing him that Hughes had violated probation for an auto theft conviction two years earlier. On January 24th, the judge revoked Hughes's probation, and he was finally put behind bars. The earliest he could be released was November, giving the Fairfax County prosecutor ample time to build his case. Without sufficient evidence to file charges, Hughes had remained free. But now, with Hughes safely put away, the FBI had the time needed for the extensive testing required by the trace evidence. There was still a chance Melissa's body might be found, but without it, the case against Hughes would have to be made in the FBI lab. Already, FBI examiner Doug Diedrich had found his first big break in the case. I remembered some black animal hairs in the debris from the front seats of the car. And in looking through the little girl's nightshirt, I noticed these similar black hairs sticking out of, out of the nightshirt. So it just rang a bell. I went back, mounted those up on slides, and compared them, and sure enough, dyed rabbit hair, and they matched each other. The rabbit hairs from Hughes's car and those found on Melissa's nightgown both revealed a distinctive corncob texturing, an exact microscopic match. Agent Diedrich immediately called the prosecutor to determine whether Tammy Brannon owned a rabbit fur coat. Not only was it confirmed that Tammy Brannon owned a rabbit fur coat, she had worn it to the Christmas party. Her mother had bought it in Germany, and it was dyed an extremely rare bluish-black color almost unknown in the United States. Melissa had handled the coat at the party and at home. Diedrich had made the crucial connection between Melissa and the car of Caleb Hughes. So you not only, you tied those rabbit hairs, you tied that match, not only to the fur coat of her mother, 
peanuts. We can have peanuts. You tied it to the front seat of the car, but you also tied it to the child's environment itself. Uh, the rabbit hair is on the, on the shirt of the child. To me, I, that was a significant point in the case, because then it starts pushing me in the direction of, we might have something. And, and from there, it was a matter of digging some more, to see if I couldn't find some additional fibers that may be of value. So I started digging a little bit more, started looking a little closer, asking questions of myself, asking questions of the evidence, because it's speaking. Strange, but it's speaking to me. As week after week passed, Melissa's name eventually disappeared from the news. Life in Fairfax County had returned to normal, but Tammy Brennan was still no closer to finding her child. All right, all right. It's tremendously difficult for the family to come to terms with everything that, that has gone on, to come to terms with, with still trying to hold on to that glimmer of hope that their child's alive, and then the realization that in all likelihood, you know, they may never find their child alive or may never find the body of their child, even after they've been murdered. Tammy was forced to face the reality that by now, there was almost no chance Melissa could still be alive. We wanted to close this case and, and not just close the case in the sense of identifying and prosecuting a suspect, but we wanted to bring real closure to the case in answering the question, what happened to Melissa Brandon that night? Why did it happen? Such questions plagued Tammy Brandon. Depressed and unable to work, she remained secluded in her apartment, waiting. Agent Diedrich had examined the blue acrylic and red cotton fibers in the passenger seat evidence collected by Jim Gogan. At first glance, they appeared to match descriptions he had been given of the red tights and big bird sweater Melissa wore that night. But without a duplicate outfit to make an exact fiber comparison, he was at a dead end. As so I went home, spoke to my wife. Of course, she straightened me out right away that if it had a big bird on it, it wasn't Winnie the Pooh and it had to be sold to J.C. Penney's, having young kids of my own about the same age. Diedrich asked his wife if she kept any old J.C. Penney catalogs in the house from the last few years. She said she knew she had a Christmas catalog. He's me about being a pack rat. I think it Diedrich was astonished to find a picture of an outfit that exactly matched the description of that worn by Melissa. The FBI contacted J.C. Penney, and the store began a search of its records. For more than two months, Tammy Branham had anxiously waited by the phone for some kind of information or word about her daughter. Where is she? Then, completely unexpectedly, she received a phone call. A man's voice told her he was holding okay? Melissa for ransom and that she must deliver $75,000 the next day or her little girl would be seriously hurt. Can I talk to her? Had Melissa been found? The national statistics will tell you that a child who's abducted by a stranger is usually dead within three hours of the abduction. So the likelihood of Melissa being alive months after the abduction is extremely slim. Mom? They have Melissa. Tammy immediately called her mother, but Detective Wilden cautioned them not to let their hopes get too high. No, no, don't, don't call anyone. I'll tell you all about it. Just come over right now. Once again. Melissa Brannan was okay. about to become front page news. Detective Wilden had instructed Tammy Brannan to cooperate with the ransom demands in the hopes her daughter would be recovered alive. As extortion falls under federal guidelines, the FBI coordinated the ransom drop. The FBI SWAT team was ready when two young men showed up in the parking lot to pick up the money. I see him getting ready to open up the door. We got the bag. Go. Here we go. FBI, 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 they were quickly arrested. But did they have Melissa in their possession?
the information provided in the ransom call was so vague and so generalized, it's entirely possible that the, the, the person who called <clears throat> may have picked up that information simply by watching the news or reading the newspaper. Uh, usually if there's a ransom demand that is legitimate, they're going to have very specific information that would be known only to the abductor and probably some of the investigators. The two arrested youths were former students and roommates from a nearby university who had seen an opportunity to make some easy money out of Tammy Brennan's tragedy. They were convicted of five counts, including conspiracy and extortion in the United States District Court in Alexandria, Virginia. It turned out to be just a terrible hoax. I mean, just terrible. The, the, the notion that you would do that deliberately. Uh, to the uh, a mother who was going through what she was going through. There were copious amounts of dog hairs in the tape samples collected by Fairfax County crime scene investigator Jim Gogan, as well as dozens of human hairs. FBI lab examiners separated and painstakingly subjected each one to testing. Finally, a hair was found that was different from the others. The hair was a very light blonde, the only one of its type found in the vehicle. But it was an exact match with the hairs found in Melissa's hairbrush. Matching the human hair with Melissa was the second big match for Diedrich. But the critical link of Melissa's clothes to the fibers from Hughes's car was incomplete without a duplicate Big Bird outfit to analyze. Because it had been a special Christmas outfit, produced only once, it could not be found in stock. J.C. Penney gave the FBI a list of people who had purchased the outfit from its catalog division. They then sent FBI agents out across the country to locate those people and determine if they still had the Big Bird outfit that they had bought from the J.C. Penney catalog. And ultimately, they were able to locate a sample outfit from a, a family that still had the outfit Obtaining the outfit could mean the difference between conviction and acquittal in the case. The FBI asked the family traced through the J.C. Penney records to send it to their crime lab. Well, I remember that day pretty clearly. I, I knew the outfit was coming in. The fiber color, according to the color in the catalog, was navy blue. But the fibers that I was finding were sort of purplish blue. So I was a little anxious that maybe this wasn't the same outfit, that maybe we were going in the wrong direction. So when that package came, I was, again, un un you know, uncomfortable with even opening it, because I, was, I, w I thought I was on the right track, but I didn't, I didn't want to be wrong. I opened up the box, and sure enough, it had a purplish coloration to it. So it, it kind of gave me a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling there that I might have the right color anyway. Fibers were pulled from the red cotton skirt and the blue acrylic sweater. A thorough analysis of the fibers from the outfit indicated an identical match with the fibers from Hughes's car. From the red cotton threads to the blue acrylic yarns to the yellow cross threads from the plaid skirt, the duplicate Big Bird outfit matched in every respect with the car fibers. What I was finding was meaningful evidence that an abduction had taken place and in fact, the victim, uh, in all likelihood, had been in the front seat of the subject's car. With the new evidence, the prosecution could now piece together the actions of Caleb Hughes on the night Melissa disappeared. At the party, Hughes had tried to pick up several adult women, but when they rejected him, he sought a substitute. Fueled by frustration and alcohol, Caleb Hughes became a desperate predator with a perverse desire. His stalking eye fell upon the children. He waited and watched until an opportunity presented itself. When it did, Caleb Hughes seized an innocent and trusting child. Hey, Melissa. Remember me? Come here. By abducting Melissa Brennan, Hughes had crossed the boundary into the unspeakable. We had to relax.
we should catch up with each other. Okay. Do that. The analysis of the duplicate Big Bird outfit produced compelling evidence. It would be a powerful tool in the case against a man who investigators felt was a ruthless child molester and murderer. But Agent Diedrich had to convince the jury how incredibly unlikely it would be that these fibers had come from any source other than Melissa's outfit. He began asking people at the FBI to give him any items they may have made of navy blue acrylic. He collected more than a hundred. And the ob objective was to see, do the fibers that I found in the front seat of Cal Huscar, do they match any of these? The answer was no. From the items, Diedrich collected 126 different acrylic fibers. He made 7,983 comparison tests with those fibers against the ones found in Hughes's car. Out of almost 8,000 tests, only one succeeded in making an exact microscopic match with the blue acrylic fibers found in Hughes's car. And that was the duplicate Big Bird outfit. Whenever you match two things, it has a lot of significance. These aren't random events. These, in most cases, occur. Is it possible? You can't deny the possibility that it could be a coincidence. But after looking at this stuff for a lot of years, I'm not a big believer in coincidence. Three weeks before the trial was scheduled to begin, as investigators made final preparations for the case, a stunning development occurred. They received a phone call. Two counties away, police had just found the body of a child on the median strip of Interstate 95. I'll be right there. I called Wilden. We got in his car, and there was absolutely no doubt in my mind that um, that that's, that was going to be it, because Hughes uh, knew that area, spent time down in that area. I said, "Wow, this this is going to be it." That section of median on I-95 is wide and densely wooded. It would have been easy for Hughes to pull over, hide the body among the thick vegetation, and drive off unnoticed, and there would be little chance of someone finding the remains. But someone found a body. Was it Melissa's? If it was Melissa Brannon's body in the highway median, Fairfax County Commonwealth Attorney Robert Horan felt he could put Hughes behind bars on murder one charges. His hopes were high, but they were soon dashed. As soon as we got there, as soon as I saw it, I knew it wasn't Melissa Brannon. Because the skeleton had rings on three fingers. Uh, but it was a young girl. She's um, 13, 12, 13, 14 year old, um, who had been in that media for two growing seasons. The young girl's body was never identified. Finally, nearly one year after Melissa's disappearance, Hughes was arrested on a grand jury indictment for abducting Melissa Brannan. He was transferred from the Prince William County Jail to the Fairfax County Jail. Moran had delayed the indictment for several months in the hope that Melissa's body would be found. By then, um, I know we were all pretty satisfied that the worst had happened to the child. Uh, unfortunately, under Virginia law, uh, you can charge somebody with murder uh, without the body, but you have to be able to prove where the murder occurred. And of course, without the body in this case, um, we had no way of proving where it occurred, so we couldn't charge him with murder. Abduction with intent to defile was the strongest case that could be brought against him. Hughes pleaded not guilty.
Few people in Fairfax County believe that Melissa could still be alive. But everyone, most of all Tammy Brannan, needed to know what had happened and needed to see justice served. Because it's tremendously important that the family of that child have definitive answers, that they know what happened to their child, even if the news is not pleasant. They need to understand exactly with concrete information what happened to their child. They need to be able to have a closure. They need to be able to, to give that child the burial that they deserve and go on with their lives. With Agent Diedrich's airtight analysis of the trace evidence, Robert Horan went into the trial confident that he could convince the jury beyond reasonable doubt. The trial began on February 26, 1991. A chief part of Horan's strategy is depicting Hugh's deviant sexual behavior at the party. He produced several female witnesses who recalled the crude, vulgar sexual propositions he had made to them, and others who testified he had spent considerable time playing with Melissa and had been talking to her just before she disappeared. His behavior was even more extreme, trying to eliminate the evidence. Washing his clothes, his leather belt, his shoes. He could not account for the fresh cuts on the soles of his shoes. Nor could he account for his whereabouts for the two and a half hours between leaving the party and arriving home. But the problem for the defense is somehow you had to explain that time. And, and, and there was never an explanation. I mean, he would have gutted our case. Our case is over if you can explain any of that time. Though tests for blood on the shoes had proved inconclusive, the prosecution was now able to show the jury the exact matches made between the rabbit hairs, the head hair, and the fibers found in Hughes' car. Nonetheless, the defense argued that all of the fiber and hair evidence was purely circumstantial. It may be circumstantial, but it is powerful circumstantial evidence because it doesn't change. In order to obtain the maximum sentence for Hughes, Moran needed to convince the jury that Hughes had intended to defile Melissa once he had her in his car. And the only way the fibers from her outfit would have been found on the seat is that her, car, her coat had been removed while she was in that car. The prosecution charged that Hughes could only have removed Melissa's coat for one purpose, an attempt to defile. The true answer is that that five-year-old was seated against her will in the front seat of that vehicle. Caleb Hughes's trial lasted eight days. After nine hours of deliberation, the jury found him guilty of abducting Melissa Brannan with intent to defile. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison. For the family members, it can't end because of the eternal hope, if you will, that someday, this child that's never been seen, never been found, this child someday will, will appear. And that's, that's hard stuff. That is hard stuff. Caleb Hughes is still serving his sentence today, and the body of Melissa Brannan has never been found. Eventually, Tammy Brannan moved from a Woodside apartment complex but she never changed the telephone number that Melissa had memorized by heart, hoping that one day a call might come.